Hey yo, ore ta chi wa so, mo kaza no mo no. ID mo nai, namae mo nai, kako mo minlai mo nai, ima shikanai, nani mo kawaranai, no imi ni ikiru hi min gai. Ore la wa koko de itai, nani ga jibun no sonzai no show make up de kato, shitsuku tell these words, achi to kochi, maru de base kai, kyo kai wa de kai, kami sama wa kohe, ore ta chi wa yubiku wa it's mo don suko de, sky step wo show mo nai, kinke na dole, yas la gen no wa kito, shinu to kira you it's no go like a mega lo boss I to ga I to wo bo ko bo ko ni suru Kutsu na hyou jou ga kokoro wo shiku Un de mata hiroi atsumeru gomikuzu Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Third Impact Anime Podcast, where we talk about anime, and we occasionally talk about video games, and we talk about uh, conventions and convention culture. Hope everyone's doing well this evening. Uh, I'm doing pretty good um my name is austin here um being your podcast host for the evening and i'm joined by my fellow co-hosts megalobill hello and gearless tobias that's me on tonight's episode of the third impact anime podcast we're gonna be talking about a handful of things but uh, most of all we're gonna be focusing on talking about the series that just recently ended from this uh, spring season of anime uh, Megalobox. But before that, we're going to talk uh, real quick about the movie Fireworks that came out in theaters this past week that both Tobias and I got to see. Um, we're going to talk about that just a little bit. And then um, recently this past week was Anime Expo out in Los Angeles. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the interesting um, announcements and reveals and premieres that happened at Anime Expo. Uh, none of us were you know, insane enough to make the trek out there to California to attend Anime Expo, but uh, a lot of folks on my Twitter feed definitely were there, and uh, I was following it pretty closely throughout the weekend and keeping up with the Anime News Network coverage of it, and there's a lot of cool things to talk about, so I'm pretty excited for that. But uh, first off, I guess, um, just talk a little bit uh, to you guys. Uh, Bill, how's it going, my friend? Um, it's going pretty well. I've been mostly just doing uh, spring catch-up, uh, of course, watching Megalobox, uh, caught up with Lupin, and uh, just trying to find stuff to watch during this new summer season. Cool. Uh, Tobias, how are you doing, friend? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Pretty much the same here, just catching up on uh, last season stuff. Uh, started watching a little bit of the new season. And uh, yeah, preparing for my home commission uh, arc here in a couple of weeks. So been busy with that as well. Oh yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited for arc as well. I think I've got like three or four panels that I'm doing. How many are you doing? I mean, if you want to do more, feel free. <laughs> the more you do, the less I have to do. Oh, uh, fair enough. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, that's that's like at the end of the month. Uh, as we're recording right now, it's the evening of Monday, July the ninth. I think ARC is the last weekend of July. Well, I think so. Okay. Something I think like I would that. know this, but yeah. <laughs> so, uh, jumping right in, uh, fireworks. Yeah, let, let's talk about that real quick. So, uh, if you want to read a little bit more in depth about it, um, I did post my personal review up on the website, which is thirdimpactanime.wordpress.com, and you can read more in depth there. But uh, I guess... I guess all of my thoughts are really there. So, Tobias, did you want to talk about how what you thought about the movie? Uh, I, I mean, it was okay. Uh, I, I guess I, I've had a really good experience watching anime films in theaters lately, so that I go into every one just really excited, really ready for it. And I think this is the first time of disappoint me. Uh, I think I kind of did what most people did and was really hyped for something along the lines of your name, I even. And it, I feel like it tries to capture some of the same magic with the whole time travel uh, elements listed there. The really like beautiful visuals and the, the main characters being you know high school kids. I feel like it tries to capture the same idea, but kind of falls short in a lot of ways. Um, I feel like the ending just really wasn't as strong a message as your name, for instance. And I really could go back and watch it again. I, I think my, my gut reaction, as we kind of talked about, was I was really just not happy with it. But the more I stopped and thought about it uh, in time, I kind of wished I had thought or paid more attention to things. 
And I really wouldn't mind seeing it again, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd probably watch it again myself, but kind of as you said, like, the sort of the ideas that are brought up in, in fireworks are ideas that have been executed better in other films. Um, like like Your Name, for example, and like The Girl Who Left Through Time and all that stuff. So, I don't know, I feel like I've seen, I just have seen this film done better in other places. But, I mean, that's not to say that this movie is, like, particularly bad. It's just a little bit, meh, whatever. Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's the same thing like we were talking earlier about, you know, the Star Wars movie Solo. Like, the movie itself isn't that bad, but when you compare it to some of the other, like, recent awesome Star Wars movies... It, it's kind of difficult to to give that its own fair shake, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So I would say, um, I think at this point, it's already completed its theatrical run, but um, I'd say this is probably a show, or a movie, rather, that if it ends up on Verve for streaming, I'd say give it a, give it a watch. Um, or if it ends up on Netflix or something, just check it out there. Uh, but you, I mean... You would say if you're a fan of like that, uh, that Shaft style... Uh, the character design reminded me very much of uh, like a Monogatari series. Uh, they didn't go as crazy surreal as they tend to be in like Madoka or even uh, the Monogatari shows. I wish they had amped up just a little bit more, but there are some really cool scenes where you can kind of see their design shine. Yeah, yeah, it definitely succeeds in that regard. Like I didn't really have any visual problems with it. It was mainly just the the narrative didn't hook me, I guess. Um, but yeah, if it ends up on streaming, I'd say people give it a give it a look, but don't don't feel bad about missing it if you did. So it's it's all good. Just feel feel bad if you missed Lou because that was a really good movie. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so guys, uh, Anime Expo, um, big old San Diego Comic Con of anime, um, huge amount of announcements to talk about. So I guess we'll just jump right into that. So, uh, JoJo, uh, part five, finally happening. I'm very excited for that. It's um, never been adapted into anime before, just like part four. Um, and it's been it's been well over a year since part four wrapped up its airing. So it's very nice to finally have confirmation of part five coming out. And um, there was a little bit of leaked footage out there online that I did see. Um that I probably won't leak to because it's probably not supposed to be out there, even though I've seen it anyway. I'm very, very sorry, David Pro. You, you know, I apologize. You know where to, you know where to go if you're. Yeah, ready. yeah, you know where to go. But they did put out an official, um, like an official opening preview of the, um, like the actual anime itself. So if you if you want to check out some of the footage, go look for that. It looks it looks really good. Like it just yep. it looks awesome. It looks you know, just as good as part four looked. And I thought part four was the best looking season so far. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited. I don't know anything about about Golden Wind or Vento Oreo or whatever it is that they're going to mostly be referring to this series as, but it just looks awesome. I'm very excited for it. Now, the real question is, what classic rock song will be the opening and closing for JoJo Part 5, you think? I have no idea. <laughs> I um typically the song tends to either fit with the time period that it takes place in or like a particular theme or character. Um so because I don't know much about this part, I can't really give any guesses or any like personal preferences. Bohemian Rhapsody. I mean <laughs> I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if that's relevant at all. I mean, it could be, but uh, I, don't know. I, I love me some Queen. Yeah, that movie looks good. I hope it is. So, Tobias, what what the heck is the Dragon Pilot? Yeah, so uh, the, the Dragon Pilot, uh, Isone Tomasotan, was an anime that came out earlier this year, uh, was last season actually, that Netflix picked up, which means that it's actually a next season anime. Uh, as, as it tends to be with all their stuff. Uh, I caught one episode of that uh, on the internet and really enjoyed it. It's got a, the basic idea is uh, our main character joins like the Japanese self-defense force. Uh, I think she wants to like be a, a fighter pilot perhaps. Uh, it's been a while since I saw it, but basically the, the idea is that uh, you know, behind the scenes, the self-defense force has a dragon 
that can transform into a fighter jet. Huh. And they, there's some, I guess, some sort of like supernatural enemies they have to fight or something like that. But it's uh, it, it's really, it, it was a lot of fun. The first episode that I saw, it's got mechanical designs by uh, uh, Kawajiri. Oh, nice. You that up there. Wait, Kawajiri or? Um... Yeah, I always make this. Is it Kawa? Uh... It's not you. It's not Yoshiaki. No, it's not Kawaji. It's uh, Shoji Shoji Kawamori. Kawamori. Yeah, I always, I have to say the first name <laughs> to not mix it up because there's no yeah. flows. Yeah, so I it's got you. the mechanical designs by by Kawamori, who's of course been doing uh, mechanical designs for a lot, a lot of stuff. Just just search for his name and look up his pedigree. But uh, the little bit that I did see looks uh, a lot of fun. I'm really excited to watch it, you know, legit on Netflix. See what they do there. And uh, definitely check that out. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, that's I'm pretty cool. That one. Yeah. Yeah, I, that sounds really cool by the premise. It, I want to check that out. I wonder yeah. if there will be any dentistry involved. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> there will be some gastrointestinal uh, things. Uh, and I never the first episode. There was definitely uh, I could see some dentistry being into that. But the uh, like the designs, I mean, like the mechanical designs are his style, but the the character designs are a little more, uh, maybe more cart. I would want to say cartoony, but maybe that's not quite the right word. They're not very realistic. They're very, yeah, soft. very, uh, yeah, exact soft. Yeah, there you go. It's it's got a very unique character design style. I feel like that works for the sort of comedy that it's going for. Cool. Cool. So we got a classic manga coming back into print, and we're not talking about banana fish. We're talking about Elf and Lee. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna say classic in quotation marks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you if you've been around since uh, two thousand seven two thousand eight, you probably have watched the Elf and Lee anime. Which back in the day, everyone was like, "Oh my God, it's it's so violent! This is amazing! The song is so good!" Well, now Dark Horse is releasing the manga that the anime was based on in four omnibuses, uh, collecting the twelve volumes of it. Uh, I'm, <laughs> out of morbid curiosity, I'd be interested to see: is it just as violent, and is there? <laughs> Uh, pointless nudity, just like the Elf and Lead anime has, <laughs> like it is in the manga, and does it have an actual ending, which, unlike the anime, which kind of has a we-don't-know ending, which makes that show even uh, more, uh, less, <laughs> makes me less likely to want to go back in that show. And yeah, anybody out there listening, like, let us know what the manga is like and if it could possibly be any better than the anime, because the anime is just very not good. Yeah, just take away... Everyone thinks that anime is good just because that song. Take away the song. Not a good show. Yeah, that makes oh. me kind of wonder, like, what, what market are they trying to grab by putting this back in print? Like, is it just because it's a popular name? I mean, that could easily be just the sole reason, I think. I and mean, we were talking about the, the the graphical nature. You know, Attack on Titan has done really well the past couple of years. But Attack on Titan is good. Elf yeah. is not good. Well, I mean, I would argue, <laughs> I would argue against that. Well, there's, uh, there's, is, you shouldn't be surprised that Austin, because anime has always had an exploitation side to its medium. So there's people who are going to really enjoy the sort of explo- exploitation aspect of it and they're gonna just snap it up with like with a spoon so no, no i i hear that but i feel like other things have sort of moved into the space that elf and lead occupied and i don't know if elf and lead is really a popular title among folks that did not either hear about it or watch it back you know 10 years ago I, i'd like the, i think the real answer would be that if you could ever get sentai on the phone it's just like how many people buy the Elf and Lead Blu-ray now? That's a good Cause question. Because those numbers show is like, is that an evergreen title where people keep buying it? I like, didn't even you know like, we got a Blu-ray release. Yes, there is a Blu-ray release of Elf and Lead. Why? <laughs> and it's on high because, dive. Because, because Sentai can, that's why. 
<laughs> it's one of the few titles that still retains its ADV Films imprint uh, name because that name is still around, but it only like Sentai only uses it on like three titles, and one of them is Elfin Lead. That's so weird, right? I feel like it's it's very much a 2000s vintage series. I can, I mean, you, I would, I would, I would not blame them for playing the whole what's anime uh, promo. Before every episode, <laughs> that would anime make the experience is. complete. <laughs> oh, right now, <laughs> every time you open up one of those omnibus books, it just says, "What is anime?" <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those singing birthday cards. <laughs> Man, why don't more manga do that? <laughs> like every time you open up the like a, a volume of Attack on Titan, it plays the opening song. Yes. <laughs> Every time you open a volume of JoJo, it just says, uh, ora, 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 ora. The entire time you have the book open. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's the real, authentic JoJo experience. Uh, another series that's coming out this season is Mr. Tonegawa, which is a, I think it's a prequel of Kaiji. Something that you hear a lot of people reference as being sort of a, a classic, quote unquote classic of the, of the yachts. But I uh, want to see how that hooks people into that. And sort of continuing from there, we let's talk about some acquisitions. There, there were a lot of acquisitions. Uh, we talked about you know Elfin Lead and like the manga, but we got a few series as well. So uh, Made in Japan picked up a a couple of interesting titles that uh, surprised uh, several of us here. We have Armored Troopers Vodons, which I believe didn't they just get picked up on High Dive for streaming. Yeah, it's it's on high dive for streaming, but they announced that it's going to be coming to home video as well. And uh, for those that don't know, because I feel like a lot of people don't know or maybe they forget or something like Made in Japan is just one of the imprints of Sentai Filmworks. So it's not a separate company or anything. It's just one of their like titles like they've got ADV, Made in Japan, Sentai Filmworks, um, Kraken releasing and uh, Section 23. Yeah, Section 23. Like, all of that is the same company. They're just different names. Yeah, so uh, they picked up uh, Armored Troopers Vodon, which I'm really excited to get. Uh, those uh, DVDs have been out of print for a long, long time. So to be able to get those and collect those. Uh, again, one of my favorite classic mecha series. Uh, they also picked up Zabungle. Another one of those uh, vintage mecha shows. And they did also rescue uh, Maria Watches Over Us. This uh, 2000 era show that I believe didn't did you say just got uh, released a couple months back. Well, I know uh, I know Right Stuff slash Nozomi Entertainment had it for many years, and their their license of it just recently ran out because I remember them talking about it like not even a month ago. So it's interesting to see it you know change hands so quickly. Um, maybe. Maybe just because it was available, Sentai was able to get it for a good price. I don't know. I really have absolutely no insight on on that, but it's it's just interesting to see. Well, Austin, how how quickly did um, Anaplex of America um, republish or re-put out the Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood? Well, they um, they put it back up on streaming like less than a month after the rights went from Funimation back to the parent company with Aniplex. So really not that long, but it's still not in print anywhere. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, they still haven't re-released it on any like Aniplex style, like big, you know, box set or whatever. Licensing is a weird and confusing games at times. Yeah. Yeah. And uh so on that note there we have Viz. They just recently announced doing a reprint of the Banana Fish manga, sort of in time with the uh, new anime series that's just coming out this season. Mm -hmm. And they also announced the home video um, rights for Megalobox, which we will be talking about. <laughs> yep. Eck, do you Can you kind of go into a little bit more about what Banana Fish is about, Tobias? I, I, I'm kind of vaguely familiar with it. Banana Fish is one of those things that uh, way back when I was getting into anime, is somehow I got signed up for some sort of catalog that this sent like sent me, you know, in the mail, and I would I would pour over this catalog of all these things that I'd never heard of, and Banana Fish is one of those things that kind of stuck in my mind at that point, but I kind of forgot about 
you know, the subsequent decades since. So it was really interesting, like a blast from the past, seeing it come back. Uh, but I'm not really overly familiar with it as a whole. Mm. Well, well, since it's coming out this uh, pretty soon, I'll have to check out the anime. And uh, I'll probably do a write-up for the website. Exactly. Hey. I want to say the, the original series is very much steeped in, like, 80s culture. But the new anime is set in modern times. So on the other hand, for those of you who are more familiar with the classic, it'll be interesting to see how they modernize everything. That's good. That's good. I don't want a Ready Player One of, a, of another of another type of Ready Player One type show. Somebody uh, posted a, like a panel of, uh, of the manga where they all like get around a computer and like, what's this? A computer? And one guy knows how to use it. He's like, what? How do you how do you know how to operate a computer? What is this? Like that, I really would not carry over <laughs> to the to, you know, 20, what, 2018 show. No, I don't think it would. <laughs> uh, what also got announced is uh, Gretzko is coming back for a second season uh, in 2019. And, and Netflix is going to be putting out another season of uh, Castlevania, I want to say, this year or 2019, uh, something like that? Uh, yeah, October 20th, 26th, I would say. Oh, cool. I, I am I am excited for uh, the second season of Agretzko, but I'm I'm curious. This as a little side tangent, from what I kind of saw on Annie Twitter, um, a lot of people were complaining about it of just like, oh man, another thing on Netflix. Oh, and it's it's funny to me that it's we're in in this world where people want kind of convenience, where. Probably a second season wouldn't have been made if Netflix said, said uh, if Netflix said uh, we're not going to be put, uh, do an exclusive deal with you, because they probably saw the numbers and said this is doing really well for us. We should probably make another season. Very, very true. So I'm, I'm just I'm just curious amongst um, you, Tobias and Austin, what, what do you think of this whole thing I'm seeing on Twitter of just. How people are more of like, why can't this just be on Cruncher or why can't this just be on Verve? It it seems like people get mad when it's just like it's on Netflix or it's or when uh, Amazon was doing their exclusive anime thing um, for a anime while. Strike. Anime strike. The, but the, or friend now. Um, what do you guys think of that? I mean, at this point, I don't. I'm kind of over it. I mean, sure, I was kind of agitated back when, like, Little Witch Academia was coming out. And for a show that I really, really ministered to them, like like Little Witch Academia or Dragon Pilot, I mean, I'm going to watch it as it comes out. I'm going to find a way to do that. Uh, and if, for a show like Agretzko that I'm only casually interested in, especially with season one where I was aware of Agretzko for a while, but didn't really need to watch it right then and there. Uh, you know, I don't really mind. I, I honestly would rather just come out when they want to release it. If it means it's getting released at all, I'm happy with that. Like you said, season two probably only is because of Netflix funding it. The same with Devil Man Cry Baby, for instance. I'm, I don't think they were on the actual production committee, but I'm sure that deal really helps cement Cry Baby being made. And I don't, for those shows that I'm only casually interested in, I don't really mind. I kind of feel the same, honestly, um, because it's not like there's a drought of content, you know, because, you know, even if Crunchyroll doesn't get everything, they still get enough for there to be plenty, more than plenty of things for you to watch during any given season. So if there are one or two or three, which it's typically only about that many shows that get sort of locked in Netflix jail for a while, it's like (laughs) it doesn't really matter. Because, I mean, they are going to come out eventually, you know that. And whenever they do come out, they're going to be more accessible to a much wider audience. Because part of the reason why it does take so long for those things is because Netflix takes the time to dub them in um, both not only English, but in like French and uh, Spanish and a whole bunch of other languages. And then they release it out um, to the public. And, like, if that's what they're doing, like, that's kind of in the spirit of trying to increase um, accessibility. And I I cannot, I can't really fault them for that. Like, that's fine. Yeah, and I, I think the thing that I think people would be 
less annoyed with Netflix is if they just gave more hard release dates for their that anime. Is... Re- yes. For their anime releases. If they gave more hard release dates like they do with their other shows, I think people would be less annoyed with them because people don't like the waiting game. <laughs> it's it's like waiting around for your birthday or, or a special holiday. It just you just want to you just want to know when it's happening and what's what's going on. I think with certain projects, if it goes on Netflix, it gets a certain special visibility because Netflix is very split. Is that's not their main bag anime. Like I think Devil Man Crybaby would have gotten traction through word of mouth, but I think being on Netflix upped it somewhat because that was the that it was a kind of one of the sole things on of, of anime on Netflix among their few offerings, and that helped it gain a bigger word of mouth. Right, and usually the things that end up on Netflix end up being generally more successful because more people are able to watch it beyond just the people that are, you know, part of the quote-unquote, you know, anime-watching community. Yeah, and I think the other thing, too, to add is it's good to see competition among the different streaming players because that means that there's more content that's coming out to the fans because it. While I love Crunchyroll and I love Funimation, I wouldn't want those two to be the sole companies around doing streaming because then the content becomes less and less because they have a certain budget that they can use to spend on shows and they can only focus on what they know would be a hit for them. But with High Dive being in the game and Netflix and Amazon, that means more content is more freely available here. And I think that's always a plus. Yep, for sure. So we got a couple more um, theatrical film announcements mm-hmm. from uh, Aniplex. Uh, they're going to be putting out the film I Want to Eat Your Pancreas, which is a really bizarre title, but apparently a very excellent movie um, that is like a very serious drama or something like that. I, I don't know much about it other than I want to see it, and yeah, it's got a weird I title. kind of looked into it because of the weird title. That kind of catches your eyes. You can't not be intrigued by that. But yeah, the general kinda... premise is that our, our main character, our narrator, finds that one of his classmates, he kind of learns that she has a pancreatic disease. So it's kind of he and her going through her last year of much and coming oh, wow. together, dealing with, uh, you know, this. It sounds interesting. Uh, I kind of, when I read the title, I think it's a Frank Zappa, a Frank Zappa album. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then we've got uh, Fate Stay Night, Heaven's Feel Part 2, which will be hitting uh, American theaters early next year, which I'm very excited for, because I think, personally, like, I'm I'm kind of a, a casual Fate fan. Like, I'm not super into it. I'm proud to be a secondary. Um, but, like, Fate Zero is is kind of the peak where of, of my enjoyment of Fate. Like, I've watched... I've watched Unlimited Blade Works. I've watched Fate Stay Night 06. I've watched... Um, zero like i said i've watched a little bit of the other things and oh before i go into that by the way the fate cooking show is just fantastic like it's really (laughs) really good like the animation is just superb and i love i love all the character interactions and everything about that is just amazing but anyway i think that fate stay night heavens feel so far like just by having seen the first film is the best sequel to fate zero that i could possibly ask for at least so far so that makes me really enjoy heaven's feel and i'm very excited for part two and eventually the part three but um i'm very lucky not to have any of heaven's feel spoiled for me and i really hope that i can keep it that way so awesome yes if i was a betting man and i was coming to you with your expertise in the fate series uh, let me uh, ask how many how many variations of saber can we, can we expect to see in the second heavens filming? <laughs> at how least, many sabers will there be? At least two. <laughs> this thing's pretty light compared to my experience with Fago. Yes, at least two. <laughs> well, have fun, Fate fans. I'll eventually finish Fate Zero. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, for- after you finish that, just stop. You're fine. Yeah. So if we're going into movie announcements, we can't not talk about, if nothing else, the audacity of the next one. With Sunrise uh, co-producing a live-action Gundam movie with legendary pictures. <laughs> it's because Ready Player One showed that having a Gundam on screen is 
exactly what you need to turn your crappy movie into a slightly less crappy movie. I honestly think part of that, part of this announcement is because of the Gundam appearance and RP. Wait a minute. I have another theory. I think they're they're thinking, huh, Warcraft, the movie that was based off an, a very popular franchise of, of the Blizzard game that did really well for us, especially in China. Maybe if we take another big franchise that's big in uh, Japan or China, we can have another billion dollar head. So let's do that. <laughs> Uh, I am I am curious. I imagine they just announced that this is happening and didn't go, go into much details because yeah. there's a lot of Gundam canon you can take from. Like, there's the whole Universal Century timeline saga uh, with the Zeon, with the Zeon and that giant story arc that you can plunge through. You can go through their spinoffs, uh, or you could kind of do these separate series like Gundam Wing or uh, Blood Orphans, or I will laugh slash go nuts if they do a G Gundam movie. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like honestly, this this film announcement is really not really worth talking about or speculating about because we don't even have a director, and they haven't even started filming this thing yet. Yeah. So at this point, I I would consider this almost the same as like the Weta Workshop Ava film or that <laughs> you know uh, that that phantom like Akira live action movie that we've supposedly been supposed to get for, you know, like or 20 the, uh, years at this point. I mean, at least those have got, you know, various script rewrites and various announcements over the years. All we know is that it's just sunrise and legendary. They haven't announced a, you know, any cast, any director, there's no script. We don't have any ideas. So it very well could just get, dissolved into ether but i still yeah. think it's pretty yeah. crazy that they're either doing this they're supposedly doing this yeah yeah i guess we'll see well uh, yeah maybe hopefully it won't go into the ether like the bebop movie has been and where it's been stuck in development hell mm-hmm. um i will Phil, laugh I had, if... Phil, I had forgotten about that and i'm not happy that you're reminding me <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome <laughs> I I will laugh if the One Piece live action TV series beats Gundam to actually happening. Oh yeah, that's supposed to happen. <laughs> was it hey, Amazon? Did you say it was Amazon doing that? No, it's uh, what it's uh, Oda's involved, and it's a British uh, production oh, company. I yeah, think, right, right. I think I think it's like ITV, which is a major. Um, network in the UK is a part of it, um, but I this is going off my memory, so I could be wrong. So please don't be mad at me, Twitter people. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's I'm it's I'm not surprised because Legendary, based off their previous work, does a nerdy does a lot of nerdy stuff, but like the Warcraft movie and. Um, the Dark Knight trilogy. So if this is in their wheel wheelhouse, let's just see if this actually happens. Yeah, I guess we'll uh we'll just, you know, keep a lookout for that one. Uh and then next up is Funimation announced that they're picking up Zillion, which surprised me because that show is very old, which is does not uh fit Funimation's usual wheelhouse. No, it doesn't. That was a really interesting grab. Like, I don't really know anything about Zillion. That was, you know, definitely before my time. But uh, typically Funimation doesn't really dabble in very, very old, like, vintage things. With the exception of their weird license of uh, Speed Racer. Or um, Astro Boy. Bright Stuff has Astro Boy. Wait. Oh, wait. I'm mixing up my, um, mixing, mixing up my productions then. It's all good, but yeah, they've got they've got the Yamato reboot, so I I guess they are kind of dabbling in vintage stuff. I guess that's kind of a an in thing right now with discotech getting more popular. But I mean, stealing not... stealing discotech's turf. I don't like. This. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Like that doesn't really seem to be Funimation's you know bread and butter. So I I I definitely wonder how they'll treat it, what they'll do with it. I mean. I don't know well, anything about it, so it's just interesting to see because they rarely do stuff like that. If if I know Funimation, this won't see the light of day for the next five years. 
<laughs> it'll come out in another like head shaped box. The only, <laughs> the only way you can get the Japanese version. <laughs> Man, I, I, hope so. I hope so. Yeah, that'll be that'll be interesting. I guess I'll I'll keep my I'll keep a lookout for that one. Put it right next to your speed racer head. Oh yeah, of course. And then uh, our next uh, announcement down the road is uh, Yen Press, uh, Press announced that they had also licensed a few things. Uh, yeah. Tobias, I, I know that you paid attention to this pretty well. Um, they licensed Penguin Highway and uh, Walk On Girl. Um, what, what did you think of these announcements? Yeah, so these are both novels by uh, Tomihiko Marimi who had also done the novels for uh, uh, the Tatami Galaxy and the Eccentric Family, who have also previously uh, gotten animated adaptations. Uh, as well, we'll be seeing the Penguin Highway movie coming out this season, and uh, the Walk On, the United Short Walk On Girl movie getting released over here uh, in August, I believe. So it's really cool to see, not only do we have this I guess this new wave of Yuasa science art stuff with Cry Baby and you know Lou Over the Wall and Night is Short Your On Girl. We've also got this uh, new appreciation of Morimi's works as well. So I'll definitely be checking those out. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll get. I don't, I don't think the Tommy Galaxy was ever localized over here, the original novel. But uh, if so, if it does happen as a result of these acquisitions, I would be definitely interested in picking them up. It's. It's interesting that I'm seeing more um, companies license uh, full-on novels like Viz has their own imprint that focuses on Japanese uh, novels. Like they released all the Legend, of, they released the first three or four Legend of Galactic Heroes novels. So yeah. that's 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 great to hear that those are actually being localized here in the West. And it's cool that these aren't just like light novel, the typical night novel crap that. You see most <laughs> usually referenced them right over here. Uh, these are actual, you know, adult novels. They're book books. Yeah, they're actual <laughs> books, not picture books. My Little Penguin Highway can't possibly be this cute. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Get out, Austin. <laughs> Kick it from the Discord. <laughs> and the I think it's the Tayo, Ma Ma Tayo Matsumoto uh, works well, like, uh, you know, Ping Pong and uh, Tectonic and Creed. Just keep bringing them over here. Keep doing it. I'm down for it. Speaking of ping pong, I am almost done with that show. I've watched about eight episodes. It's really good. Yes. Glad you finally turned around on it. Welcome yep, yep. to welcome to the club, Austin. I'm so glad you're part. Mm-hmm. I'm happy to be here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> now watch Kaiba. <laughs> Working on it. Uh, all right, so... Uh, Tobias, we've got some trigger stuff to talk about. So all the all the stuff we talked about so far, just kind of assorted news uh, coming out of Anime Expo. But of course, uh, our favorite studio, Trigger, was there. And they mentioned a bunch of new stuff. And maybe not a whole bunch of new stuff, but there's a couple of really fun announcements. First being that they announced they just started a Patreon as of oh, yesterday. Oh my god! Yeah, so they started a Patreon, which is really ridiculous to see. It's ridiculous for a number of reasons. So we have this Japanese anime studio, you know, that usually sort of stick to very, you know, Japan-centric business model with production committees. It was weird when they did a Kickstarter a few years back, but now they're doing the Patreon. So they only have two tiers. You for one dollar a month, you get access to a uh, you know a live stream drawing plus a you know, JPEG file of the actual result of that drawing. For $5 a month, you get not only that, but also the Photoshop files, like the, the, the whole .psd, and these sort of files for the drawing, so you can actually pick it apart and see what they did. So there's no ridiculous out-of-the-way, like Kickstarter backer levels, tiers, where you're spending several tens of dollars to get some exclusive stuff. It's just very much a tip jar. So uh, as of now, uh, again, July 9th, they raised $6,922. Uh, at least uh, $6,923, since I just put mine in. <laughs> uh, 2,188 patrons, uh, including myself. So uh, what do you guys think about this? Um, um, 
I, Austin, you, you go first. I mean, I, I think there's been some interesting discourse surrounding this whole trigger Patreon idea, and um, I think some of it is legitimate, and I think some of it is a little bit um, maybe a little too harsh, maybe. Um, then again, I, I'm not entirely familiar with all of the ins and outs, but it, it doesn't seem like Trigger is trying to use this particular Patreon to do anything other than little small gestures for their fans. Um, like, there's there's no way that this, you know, $7,000, or even if they doubled that to, like, let's say they get 4,000 patrons and they get, like, $15,000, like... That's still a very, you know, minuscule amount of what it would take to actually fund at any level an anime production um, or to help, you know, animators themselves or, or what have you. So I don't know. I, I see this as a, as a very interesting thing. I, I think I think they might be treating this more as like an experiment with the Patreon model, sort of keeping their scale small, keeping expectations low. And I think that's wise. Um, but I also think that a lot of people that have expressed um, uh, their issues with this definitely bring up some good points about, you know, just the nature of, of working in anime in Japan in general. But this doesn't seem to be really related to that. I don't I, I see those as like an apples and oranges kind of issue. Like, what, what do you think about that, Tobias? Well, I mean... I, I kind of agree. It's kind of, I see it as more of an experiment than anything, very much like their Kickstarter uh, for Little Witch Academia back in the day. I'm glad to see them kind of branching out and trying something beyond the traditional, uh, you know, merchandise fuel system that we see through, used throughout anime and this kind of warped you know, anime production and popularity over the past, you know, 10, 20 years. And uh, like you said, it's very much just a drop in the bucket. Uh, I was kind of skimming uh, Miles Thomas' Twitter. Again, that's Miles of Crunchyroll, who kind of works as handles their uh, a lot of business aspects and sees a lot of the behind the scenes things. Uh, to quote him, uh, if the top 100 Patreon accounts combine their collective income, it would take them four months to generate enough money to produce a single TV anime series. Ooh. So for Twitter, just you know, for I would say rather for Trigger, just pulling in you know almost seven thousand dollars, that's really not anything. Uh, to be fair. And I guess on the other hand, like I, I know that, you know, Triggers kind of, they're kind of, I believe their parent company is Aniplex. So it's not like they're really hurting for money. But if you look at Triggers pedigree and like, you know, uh, Gynax's pedigree, like they're known for kind of like running out of the quote unquote budget and having issues with, you know, budget constraints. Mm -hmm. So if, it, if an extra $7,000 or whatever a month, like helps them do what they want to do, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, on the other hand, if you compare it to Kickstarter, you know, back when that started, that was very much meant to be, you know, a project for people who needed to raise that money. But it very quickly became a pretty much a pre-order system. We had all these big game companies that were putting out their games, and it was pretty much just become a way to pre-order the stuff rather than a project that really needs the money. Remember uh, Funimation and Escaflone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Escaflone box set. But I mean, you see that throughout Kickstarter as well. And like, I've just come to terms with, because way back in the day, like I was very much adamant about only backing projects that needed it and just resigning myself to buying the actual product when it finishes. But it's just not how the system is treated. And likewise, if Patreon, if we want to take the original idea of directly contributing to your, your favorite indie artist and turning into a place where to contribute to your you know, full production, you know, anime studio, I think it all comes down to what I'm giving and I'm only giving a dollar a month. So I can very easily give a dollar a month to get a JPEG, you know, a, a, a custom art from my favorite studio. I don't have a problem with that. Hmm. If it were like 10, 20 bucks, I would, I would consider it. I would think more about it, but it's a dollar a month. So I don't personally care. Yeah. I think the the tip jar analogy is, is very appropriate in this, in this context for this particular thing. I, I guess, but as someone who's a frequent follower of YouTubers and podcasters who use Patreon as a set as a big force of their income, my my biggest issue with it is well, I like it on certain degrees because they're very upfront with everyone that's signing up of just gonna get a lot of frequent updates. This is what you're getting. 
with the JPEG files. The thing I, I'm not a big fan of is its actual goal. It seems very vague to me of just like, yeah, we want to do merchandising and streaming and more events. It, it sounds like PR jargon to me when they say that. And that's probably not the case. That might be true with all the stuff they're trying to do. I just wish they were more concrete in, in what the Patreon is actually for. Just like, kinda, are you are you trying to get more merchandise out here to fans? Are you trying to do more uh, streaming events like on Twitch or on YouTube or on a? I'm I'm just like I'm just more concrete in your goal. That's what I would like. I definitely agree with you, Bill, on that. Um, especially the vagueness of it, like. Because a, a part, the, the way that they've worded it is is a little bit vague. Um, if you really look into it and see, like, if if what they are trying to do, like, if the specifics of it are, like, those JPEG files and, like, the streams and whatnot, then, you know, then, then that's one thing. But, you know, just generally reading through the actual Patreon page itself, it does seem a little bit vague. But then again, this is, like... This this thing hasn't even been out for a week yet, so they could they could change it, they could make updates. So I I really don't know. I don't I don't really want to pass that judgment too quickly. But you're you're definitely right. Like at this point, it does seem a little bit vague. But I think that its vagueness can be a little bit excused because they're not really asking much from their patrons. Like Tobias said, it's it's a dollar. Like if it was if they were doing like three hundred dollar tiers or something, then I would be like. Yeah, they really need to fine tune and tell people exactly what it is that they can expect. But for a dollar, it's like I, I mean, I could give just any rando a dollar. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. and uh, they they mentioned in the I don't know if it's been edited yet, but they mentioned that you know you know in the, like the first twenty four hours the, the the wording was if we get up to fifteen hundred dollars, then we'll start doing the live stream because the initial yeah. fifteen hundred dollars would be them buying the streaming worthy computer. So, I mean, oh. obviously, a studio like Trigger was going to get more than that, but I don't know if they quite anticipated that. I think they're still not really sure how much money they're going to be able to get from us Westerners. But, yeah, they were able to blow past their initial $1,500 estimate uh, really, really quickly. So we'll see if they adjust to that or give a more definite timetable. or you know, budget. I, I will say, though, you have to take that budget goal with a grain of salt, I would say, because, yeah, it's $1,500. That's a that's, that's a good little bit amount of money, but with any type of thing, whether it be Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or Patreon, you start at the lowest number you can get to um, make people feel like, oh, we're going further with the goal. I should We should get the number even higher. So kind of like what um, a lot of Kickstarters do is they'll do a base minimum just to make sh- and then put a bunch of stretch goals. Uh, to get the number of uh, funds to go up, but I, that's not the case here. But uh, I'm just, I'm just interested to see what they actually do with this experiment. And you're right; it's it's only been it's been barely a week that this has been up. So I'm going to be keeping up with this because um, one of my rules is uh, I have an internet law. If if you do a podcast long enough, or if you're on YouTube long enough, eventually a Patreon will happen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at this point, if you're doing something for that length of time, you really should start to expect some, you know, something back about it. If you if you develop a fan base, you can ask for some cash, and you'll probably get it. Not every not every project becomes a self sustaining one, but you see a lot of people uh, have have turned this kind of stuff into their their primary source of income, their job. Yeah, like um, one of my favorite podcasts, Retronaut, they get their funding through partially through patreon which and then partially through advertising so i i think it's great that the, there's the crowdfunding model that can help people explore their passions and make that a full-time job and i'm i will be interested to see if other studios or other more corporate entities get on the patreon model i will i will be a little cynical if i see a funimation patreon <laughs> yeah yeah, don't yeah, don't thanks. don't don't remind me of the Funimation Kickstarter, which makes that 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 just uh, I I really like Funimation and I think the people there are great, but I, I think that was an abusive Kickstarter, in my opinion. But that's that's another that's another podcast for another day. 
I, yeah, I think it was just the nature of the show. Like, they could have put out Escaflone pretty easy, I think. If it was something else, maybe, but I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of in agreement with you, Bill. You want to run over some of the other trigger stuff, Tobias? Yeah, so at their panel, they see they they had the the premiere of SSSS Gridman, which uh, you know the adaptation of that classic Sentai Tsuburaya Productions uh, series. I haven't seen it yet. I don't know if it's actually out beyond the convention. It's it. They said that it's going to be released in the fall by Funimation. Really? It's not. Oh no, that's right. You're right. It's one more season away. Mm-hmm. Dang. Okay. Well, I guess we'll wait on that then. Uh, so they showed the first episode. Uh, initial reviews I heard were that the the like the anime character segments are okay, but the actual action segments are where it's at. They really nail that classic, uh, you know, tokusatsu feel. I'm glad to hear that. And they also just talked a little bit about their next series, Promare, which will be a little more. Uh, It'll feel a little bit more like what they're they're kind of known for. This is directed by Imaishi, story by Nakashima, and uh, I want to say there was another name there, but I can't recall off the top of my head now. But Promare will focus around a character that looks a lot like Kamina from Gurren Lagann, <laughs> and he works uh, with a like a firefighting group that use robots to fight the fires. Nice. I haven't seen any of the any more really the animation. Just there's one new promo picture of the main character, and yes, he very much looks like Kamen's brother. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Apparently, somebody somebody asked them that, uh, like, well, how come, like, what's the resemblance to Kamina? And they're like, oh, that's just the way Yamaishi draws male character. They all tend to gravitate toward looking like Kamina. So <laughs> we'll see how that works out. At least they're honest. Yeah, at, at least they are. And then they also uh, announced a little bit more of their Kill la Kill fighting game, working with, you know, Arc System Works. Uh, that classic fighting game company worked on, you know, Blade Blue and Guilty Gear and uh, Dragon Ball Fighters. The, the, uh, the, the, they showed a little bit more of the Kill la Kill game. It's a 3D style brawler, so it's not going to be like fighters at all. Uh, Initial reviews, and honestly, my review is as a game, it looks eh, okay. But apparently, the story itself is going to focus more on some of Sasuke's machinations behind the scenes and do a little bit more, some of the more side stories in Kill a Kill. So, uh, I am interested in playing it for that reason. Well, it's going to be a sorry, it's going to be a Steam and PS4 release. As a nice, yeah, that that makes sense because uh. Uh, recently, with the success of Valkyrie Chronicles, a lot of more, a lot of Japanese developers have come to embrace Steam, and uh, the PC marketplace is really kind of blown up now uh, in Japan. Thankfully, <laughs> I, I'm, I'll be curious to see if um, maybe it seems weird that excluding maybe a Dragon Ball Z game, anime game seems to always be in the gutter. So maybe Kill a Kill will be the exception. And I hope SSS Gridman or Promare will make me uh, like a full-on trigger show. Because excluding Little Witch Academia and their shorts, I I can't. I seem to not be able to get into the trigger full-length shows. I mean, at least you like Space Patrol Luluco. Well, that's their shorts. That excluding their shorts and Little Witch, I I just can't seem to get into their other work. Maybe we'll have to do a maybe we'll have to do a kill a kill uh, retrospective. To get Bill to finish that show. I haven't actually wanted to rewatch that, so we yeah. should do that. Yeah. All right. It is set in stone. We will do that eventually. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> All right. But what we're doing today is talking about Megalobox. So we're gonna take a quick break. You're gonna listen to some of the rad music from Megalobox, and we'll be back in just one second.
Hey folks, we are back for the part two of our episode where we're going to be talking about the recent anime that just wrapped up, uh, Megalobox. But first of all, while during the break, I did think of something real quick related to Anime Expo. So you guys were kind of following it on Twitter as well. So, and Anime Expo definitely seems to have its like pros and cons and whatnot. But like, in your personal opinion, like Tobias, would would you go to Anime Expo? Oh, I would not go to Anime Expo at all. <laughs> I feel okay. like it's like San Diego Comic Con where they're both pretty much just big commercials. Yeah, there is no reason to go to either one of these events unless you live local-ish, unless you want to hang out with friends or you know go visit some of the local stuff. Uh, but as far as the event itself, uh, as you can easily see on Twitter, it is incredibly packed full of warm bodies, uh, shoulder to shoulder, pretty much all throughout. Uh, it is not worth that experience by itself. Luckily, we get all of the good parts, all the news and the acquisitions uh, on social media and on the internet. So there's no reason for me to ever have to go to Anime Expo. <laughs> I will never go to Anime Expo, probably. I don't know. See, I, I would hesit- I would I would agree with all the things that you just said, but if they were to fix those things, I would definitely want to go to Anime Expo. Fix them? <laughs> you're acting so silly, Austin. Not, I know. They're, they're not gonna fix anything. <laughs> they're just gonna keep it the way it is because that's how they, that's what they know how to do. But uh. <laughs> to, to your to your general question, I for the most part I wouldn't want to go because one I don't want to be in a line in a hall H type line for yeah. for a uh, panel. It's no fun. What? I am jealous of is because they're on the West Coast, they're more easily to get more higher tier Japanese guests. It's like going a guy. Going a guy was there, and there's a great picture of going a guy with two people dressed up in a hunting cosplay, which is amazing. Uh, like I would love to meet him, or uh, they had actual um, members from uh, Idol Master, uh, not the main Idol Master troupe, but one of the spinoffs, perform a live concert there, which is, sounds really cool, and I wish I could have gone to that. So I would go if, depending on the Japanese guests, uh, that would be my only kind of, like, maybe I would go, but for the most part, I wouldn't want to go. Yeah, See, for the, when, with regards to that, though, like, that and the premieres they showed... They're so difficult to get into because there's so many people there. Like, I like the fact that Gona Guy was there, like, the first time he's been in the States for, like, 25 years. That's really cool in and of itself. But realistically, none of us, had we had gone, were likely to actually meet this guy. True. Because none of us were going to wait, like, at, the, you know, like, 4 o'clock in the morning to get in line to do this stuff. So it's a great idea. But because of the sheer crowd, it, it's honestly best. To not have to put yourself through that. Actually, in comparison, yeah. at at Animazement when Watanabe was there, because I know he wasn't he doing autographs. Yeah. So, like, how long was the line to get an autograph from Watanabe? I wait. I I got really lucky. I I I <laughs> I snuck past the uh, line stops here person about <laughs> ten, <laughs> about ten minutes after they had stopped letting people in the line. So, because they just weren't paying attention, they were looking at something else. So, thanks, animes, but I really appreciate it. <laughs> but, but I snuck past them, and I only had to wait about ten minutes to get Watanabe's <laughs> autograph. And then I told him he was my favorite director, and he said thank you, and I felt just elated. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm sorry that the story just broke me. <laughs> You're welcome, but. Uh, but- I think, like, Hank got his autograph, like, the first time he went there, and the line maybe was an, maybe an hour. That doesn't maybe. surprise me, but then again, that, for Watanabe and for Animazement, like, that's not, that's not awful. That's pretty reasonable, I think. Yeah, so, like, if it was more than two hours, I'd be like, no thanks. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, and I think just the other problem, too, is AS by its nature is San Diego Comic Con of <laughs> of anime cons, and so and because it's based in California, all the main industry players can easily go to that con. 
Um, so that allows for more premieres and that allows for more exclusives. And that's, that's the same problem with San Diego is because they're based really close to Los Angeles. So all the big studios come down and are able to do their stupid exclusives and all that stuff. If you took away the exclusives, then I think the crowds would go down. And then, but that's not going to happen. And I think the, the other problem is just their crowd management is really poor. Like I saw, I heard there was over a hundred thousand people, more than a hundred thousand people at AX, which is almost approaching the level size of San Diego Comic Con. If they just go over uh, to around one hundred sixty-seven thousand, which is what I saw on one um, attendance number from a few years ago, then they're they're exactly at San Diego Comic Con levels, which is crazy to me. Yeah, they, I I feel like I would want to go, but they would have to fix those like systemic problems, like the crowd control issues, and I think that would that fixing that one problem would make a lot of other problems not quite as bad. But I I just kind of like you said, Bill, it's a little bit of a a little more optimistic than probably what I can hope for. And they and I know this this is counterintuitive, but they need to de-emphasize ex- exclusives, like when it comes to Thanks. merch. They're not going to do that. <laughs> They're not going to do that, but I think that would cure a lot of the uh, con um, line issues because there's a lot of just moochers just trying to buy up um, certain gear to sell on second hands. And that just that leads to an, that leads to longer lines and more annoyance. So, but I want to get to Megalobox. Me too. I really enjoy the show. Good idea. All right. So, Megalobox. Uh, Tobias, do you want to introduce a little bit of the background behind where this series comes from? So, Megalobox itself is an is an anniversary project for uh, Tomorrow's Joe, or Ashtono Joe, uh, also called Champion Joe, uh, Rocky Joe, and <laughs> at one instance, Joe who aims to win Wonderful Tomorrow. Uh, so Tomorrow's Joe is really interesting as far as Western fandom because it's a show that not many people have heard of, but everyone has seen referenced in some way. This is a uh, boxing anime from, uh, let's see, from the 80s. The uh, original, the original series, the original half of the show, we never got licensed. The movie is now picked up by Discotech, and the second series is uh, licensed by Crunchyroll. So you can kind of get uh, the story as a whole through those two mediums. Uh, sort of one way to sort of casual, you know, combine uh, you know, the Tomorrow Show experience together. But while being one of those things that most people aren't really aware of, there's a, a lot of visual language that gets uh, referenced in even anime, even of today. So, like, the classic finale, the ending scene where Joe looks down and the screen kind of gets grayed out. This, like, blue-gray tent with, like, these harsh uh, pencil lines is referenced pretty much any time a character, like, gets dejected or, or dies. Uh, you know, like, in Duran Lagan, that one episode with Kamina, like, that is straight up a Tomorrow's Show reference. So, um, I, I only learned this recently through listening to the audio commentary on third special uh bye bye lady liberty i did not know that there's actually a term that describes those type of scenes what's the term the term is harmony oh Hmm. so those those scenes are called harmony scenes and i did not realize that until that commentary because that uh that particular lupon special was directed by osamu dezaki uh who did a lot who he's worked on he worked on anime since the very beginning with astro boy um, but he was the main director on um, the uh, on Tomorrow's Joe, like I think both series and the film as well. And that's sort of one of the the types of scenes that he invented. So uh, I, every everyone has seen that type of scene, like you like you've uh, like you outlined Tobias, but not a lot of people know know what it's called. And that exactly. that's what it's called. And I, I didn't realize that, but it, it's neat that that has like an actual name. It's harmony. Exactly. Yeah, and whenever you see an uh, anime character, like whenever they vomit, and the vomit is all like shiny and sparkly and glittery, <laughs> that is also a straight up uh, Tomorrow's Show reference, as well as whenever you see a classic like cross counter punch, whenever two characters just kind of like punch each other at the same time, 
Uh, you see that again in Gurren Lagann, as well as uh, like Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Super. Uh, and I've even seen a picture here where there's one in like uh, Legend of the Galactic Heroes, where there's just a like, cross counter that, again, kind of started with uh, tomorrow's show. And it's just one little visual thing that any anime fan who's been a you know a fan for any significant period of time, whether or not you knew it, you were influenced by this classic series. And I, I haven't really seen any. I, I watched the first two episodes kind of going in uh, either to this podcast and didn't really have enough time to check out more. It's definitely a part of its time, at least the, the beginning of it is. But I've heard enough good things about the way the, the show shakes down that I'm definitely going to check out more of it when I can. Ashina no Joe is a, is a cultural touchstone really in Japan because when it was released, because at the manga was released in the late 60s and went up to the early 70s. And that was a time of change going on in Japan's culture where it, uh, we were, they were becoming more modern with technology and things uh, socially, um, expression was becoming more free. Um, in clothing and in style, so um, it's as a the Ashino sorry Ashino no Joe is a is a cultural is a strong cultural touchstone, which um, doesn't surprise me that it's still well remembered um, in all these anime projects. Oh, for sure, yeah. Like this is like post war Japan. We have these themes of this 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 orphan, this guy on the street, just kind of sticking up for himself, you know, fighting back against these corrupt you know, people around him. And it was very much this, you know, make your own way story. It was very, very important for the culture, you know, at the time in Japan. And a lot of that ties into some of the things in Megalobox, which we'll talk about here near the end of the cast. So the original Ashita no Joe manga was written by a gent named Iki Kajiwara. It was actually a pen name uh, for a guy named Asao Takamori, uh, who also created a uh, tiger mask among other many manga uh, during that particular era of history. Uh, it was illustrated and the character designs were from Tetsuya Chiba, who is a multiple, multiple award-winning manga artist uh, throughout his entire career. Um, and this was one of the first, like I said a moment ago, this is one of the first series that director Osamu Dezaki worked on. Uh, Dezaki is an incredibly influential director. He worked on things like uh, Space Adventure Cobra and uh, Gogol 13 and worked on a lot of the very early uh, Lupin the Third uh, TV specials. I think he directed the first four or five of those. Um, yep. And um, the legendary Masao Maruyama, who is the uh, founder of Studio Madhouse, the founder of Studio Mappa, the founder of Studio M1, and the founder of whatever studio he's going to make next week. <laughs> yeah, what studio has any founded? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a very influential guy. Um uh, he helped produce the pilot film for this. And uh, the uh, production house that made uh, the original Ashita no Joe was uh, Mushi Productions, which is uh, Osamu Tezuka's production studio. The series ran from uh, January of 1968, the manga did, uh, to May of 1973 and went up to 20 volumes. Um, kind of like uh, Tobias already touched on, there's uh, a lot of different... Um, versions of this there are uh two anime television series two films uh, a few live action movies and video games and whatnot so there, there's a lot of content out there for ashita no joe um and like tobias said some of it is available on crunchyroll uh with megalobox included so um that's that's very nice to have at least some of that available and, and hopefully if the film does well for uh for discotech maybe there's a possibility that they will put out the series on home video it's always a possibility um maybe um the ma the actually no joe manga has not been released here in the states maybe with the pop if megalobox becomes really popular if it sells well since this is also a manga publisher they might try and publish action no joe here which would be interesting there is going to be a manga adaptation of megalobox that is happening so I imagine that oh, really? this is more likely that they will put out that adaptation of oh. the uh, uh, probably. So and uh, just as a fun callback, uh, both the original author Kajiwara and the uh, illustrator Tetsuya Chiba both have a cameo in Megalobox. 
Oh, really? <laughs> There's a scene uh, later in the series, right before Megalonia, when they're having the party on the boat. Mm-hmm. And the guys that are like hanging out the window, yeah, that's that's them. I love I love it when anime do does that. <laughs> that's amazing. So as for Megalobox itself, we're bringing it into the the modern production here. Uh, it's animated by Studio TMS, who has also been doing. Uh, the recent Lupin the Third series uh, that Megalobox and and that series they share a few aesthetic similarities um, and some uh, some staff as well um, related to the Lupin franchise, which is very interesting because there was a uh, historical connection through Dezaki connecting uh, the original Tomorrow's Joe to some of the original Lupin the Third. Uh, so it seems like there's been a a pretty uh, consistent connection between uh, Ashita no Joe and uh, Lupin the Third, all the way since the very beginning. Um, so the director is uh, Yo Moriyama, who is a key animator on, guess what? Uh, Lupin the Third, the woman called Fujiko Mine. He also worked uh, on the series Monster and the film Redline, and worked on the openings of both Death Note and Attack on Titan, uh, both of those being, um, uh, well, Death Note being a Madhouse production and Titan being Studio Wit, which is a spinoff uh, studio of uh, Studio Madhouse. So uh, the music production was handled by a artist named Mabanwa, who uh, he also worked on Kids on the Slope. And uh, he's a pretty popular like jazz, hip hop, fusion artist and music producer in Japan. Uh, he's worked on a bunch of uh, television series, theme songs, not necessarily anime, but like TV series. Is, and he's collaborated with Yoko Kano before. And he's worked on Numerous promotions for various things of like the clothing store Uniqlo and Google and even promotions for the Osamatsu-san anime. Um, And he hasn't worked a whole lot in anime soundtracking, but he's done a whole lot of work and is incredibly talented. Go out there and check out some of his music um, on YouTube. You can find a lot of his music videos out there and his his music is really rad. It's very unique and I like it a lot. And you, his name is spelled M-A-B-A-N-U-A. So we've got the character designer for Megalobox, and that is uh, Hiroshi Shimizu, who is a key animator on several projects and was a character designer for Michiko and Hachin. And you can definitely see uh, the through line there between Michiko and Hachin and uh, Megalobox. And as for our voice cast, um, Joe is played by Yoshimasa Hasoya, who also plays Reiner in Attack on Titan, uh, Tokuyami in My Hero Academia, and Otabek in Yuri on Ice. We've got uh, Nanbu, who is voice acted by Shiro Saito. He's been a voice actor since the 90s, and he's worked on various characters in series like One Piece and Case Closed, uh, Bleach, Dragon Ball Super, Black Lagoon, and a whole bunch of other things. So Yukiko Shirato is voiced by Nanako Mori, and uh, she's very interesting because she is a retired Takarazuka actress. And uh, for those that are not familiar, like Takarazuka, if I'm saying that correctly, I think I am, um, is the style of Japanese theater that features all women playing the characters. Um, the Sailor Moon musicals were good, are good examples of the Takarazuka style of theater. Um, and she she had been a an actress in that uh, in theater for many many years. Uh, she played uh, Oscar in a 2006 stage production of The Rose of Versailles. And she's only recently started working on anime, um, most featured as um, Kira Chocolate in uh, uh, Kira Kira Pretty Cure a la Mode. Uh, So if there are any Pretty Cure fans, you might know her as Kira Chocolate. And she's only barely started working in anime. This is like her third role, but um, I have a feeling like she will probably get more roles um, in anime in the future. And uh, Sachio, our... uh, uh, feisty little dude character uh, is voiced by Michio Murase, who also plays Susie in Little Witch Academia, which is pretty awesome. Cannot see that connection at all. Me neither. Totally doesn't <laughs> sound like it. <laughs> so, Bill, why don't you tell us what Megalobox is about? Sure. Megalobox is about Megalodonia, the premier boxing tournament which is about to begin. And according to the promoter, uh, anyone has a chance to enter. Sadly, that's not really the case. You can only enter if you have an ID and you're part of, you're an actual citizen in quotation marks, which is not the case for our main characters, uh, Junk Dog and Nabu. 
Young Doug, he is an underground fighter, but he knows he's too good to fight in the underground illegal boxing rings. But he doesn't have the resources to get any higher than the underground fights. And Nabu is a washed up trainer that due to uh, debts, he and Junk Dog have to fix their fights. <laughs> so that way the debt can ever so slowly go down, if it ever does go down. Um, but one night after meeting the current Megalobox champ, Yuri, uh, Junk Dog decides to th- stop uh, throwing the fights. Uh, defeating one of his opponents in a single punch in the first round. Uh, Nabu, in a desperate move to save his and Dog's life, uh, says to the mobster, we can get into Megalodonia and win it all. With the winnings, we can pay off our dead. Uh, it's a long shot, but I know Young Dog can do it. The mobster is kind of amused by this desperate gamble, so he graciously accepts this plan, giving Junk Dog a new identity, Joe. And that is and that, the beginning of our story. Yeah, that basically covers like the first two episodes or so. Yeah. Uh, that's the end of yeah, episode two. Yep, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and I think from here, let's go ahead and give a blanket spoiler warning for everything. Like we're gonna be talking, digging a little deeper about the show. So if you haven't seen it yet, go watch it, come back, listen yeah. to the podcast. Just, just quick recommendation. Go watch it. It has, it has really beautiful animation, and it's relatively short, only twelve episodes, so you can 13, get through 13. it in a uh, thirteen. You're right. Uh, you can get through it in a solid weekend. So I highly recommend it. But on to spoilers. Man, this show. There's, there's so much great about this show. It, it's really tough to start. But like from the very yeah. first scene, we see like Junk Dog, like in the very opening credits, like he's just riding his bike not going to stop. And we see him there and then several times pretty much almost commit suicide with, with this. To the point where it's almost uh, like a running theme with him. So we're like, we see like this tension that he builds up in the, in the fights where he knows that he can't go all out. Like All he wants is just to actually have a, an actual fight, but he can't because the Anandu has fixed these fights and that's how they have to survive. That's the only way they can make a living and survive. So he has all this frustration that he takes out you know, on himself uh, on the bike. I think those are really subtle touch for them to, for the very first scene. Like the dude's trying to kill himself, and he does this several times throughout the series. Yeah, and he he has this mentality throughout the show of just I don't care what happens. I'm going to fight to the death. Basically, is his mentality of of going through all the challengers and dealing with um, the dangerous threat of their lives uh, being killed. Like, he doesn't care. He's, I am going to, I'm going to win, win Megalodonia no matter what. The thing that I like about the show is there's development and growth where they're not, they don't just stay in one lane or they don't just stay as one personality type as the show progresses where Junk Dog has this, Bite to him, or Joe has his bite to him throughout the series, but he get, he gets more confident and he's not as um, brash and uh, just going fighting through uh, just based off his emotions. As the show progresses, he's using strategy uh, mm-hmm. and he's thinking things ahead. Whereas when he first meets Yuri in the first episode, he's just on you know, just his pure emotions of how he should fight, which I think is a sign of just his growth as a fighter and that he's using his um, brashness channel. Uh, the, the, his brashness isn't consuming him when he's in these fights as it's the not. show progresses. I mean, it feels like a classic sort of uh, like sports show trope where at the beginning he's pretty much just going on his raw talent and just his you know, sheer ferociousness in these fights to parallel the you know, analogy with him being a, a stray dog. But, you know, because he's got to make it to Megalonia, because it's, everything is riding on this, because, you know, his desire is to, is to make it and show, you know, Yuri just how good of a fighter he really is. He's got to actually listen to his trainer rather than just kind of blow him off. He's got to, you know, use these uh, actual tactics to his advantage and sort of 
take both Nanbu and Sachio's advice into consideration. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that was one thing that I really liked about Junk Dog uh, or Joe, whoever whoever you want to call him, uh, that I, I respected him kind of very, very quickly because I realized he just wasn't this sort of like jerkish, loose cannon type of character. Like he was very, you know, he's very like free roaming and sort of he, he wanted to do what he wanted to do and didn't want to have anyone holding him back. But um, he was also not just a meathead. And that that was very uh, refreshing to me. And I, I enjoyed that because you could tell that even in you know, his, his, you know, undying passion for wanting to be an extremely good fighter, he never really did anything to um, sort of set up those artificial barriers for himself. Uh, like, there, there, there never felt like there was this level of ego with Joe. Yeah. I felt like it was always about, you know, him, you know, acknowledging that he needs to get better and that doesn't mean that he's you know always perfect and you know always makes the best decisions you know even him and and Sachio and Nanbu sort of get into you know their squabbles and they definitely have their differences and there's definitely like a a clash of personality and a clash of vision at at points but Joe never really loses sight of what the goal is like it's about him being able to prove himself like being able to go out there and actually make a real name for himself and to do it not to not to win like fame or fortune or anything like that but just to prove like that his existence is valid and that he's got something to you know believe in and to put all of his energy in towards and and that was very refreshing because at all of those points like i I never dis uh, there was never a point in the show where I didn't like Joe like i I expected there him to be like this sort of like kind of annoying like um sort of meathead character that learns to be smart throughout the the show or something but he kind of always was like that and and that that was that was nice to me i i enjoyed that a lot because it it showed a lot of like where he came from and it and it made his journey it made his journey different it made it more more internal and i think it made the payoff at the end like much more valuable because you know whenever we do get to the end just to see where he goes from there is I think a lot more satisfying because it's like he, he reached, you know, he reached that ultimate point and then realized, all right, I made it. Now it's time to chill out. So I, I like that a lot. And that parallels a lot with the, the original tomorrow show with our main character. He's just kind of like, he's bound by his frustrations of the world around him and his trainer and that sort of focuses him into boxing and sort of the, the major plot point, you know, through the, like the latter half of that is him fighting his one rival and his whole life devoted to fighting that one rival. Just like we have, uh, you know, Junk Dog and uh, Yuri here in Megalobox. But it's a really interesting thing is in tomorrow's show, in their fight, uh, Joe Yabuki kills Rikishi, his rival, like accidentally. Oh, geez. Yeah, so like we have the Yuri, the Yuri character dies in the last, in like the second half of the original show. And Joe, the original Joe, has to sort of figure that out. And he honestly kind of crashes and burns to the point where finale is him getting the point where, well, I'm, I'm done. Like, I, I fought, I've been as hard as I can, and that's it. And it's pretty much accepted that the last scene is Joe himself passing away. That's a, that's a weird metaphor of the seven, 70s, of just, not that Japan was involved in the Vietnam from a Western perspective of just like Vietnam War stressing me out, uh, the economy's in the crapper. Uh, screw it, man. I just don't care. <laughs> so we see that a lot. And honestly, I kind of expected based on that and based on the fact that all the episode titles had the word death in them, I honestly yeah, I, expected yeah. Joe to be dead at the end. Like, I didn't think Chunk Dog was going to make it. Either that or Yuri was going to die, being the, the whole, you know, I guess, analog to the, the rival character. But I honestly expected Jung Dog to not make it. So to see the final scene that he they even they even really hit at it in that last scene right after the boxing match. Like they even they almost flat out say somebody's dead. But nope, nobody actually dies. I kind of love that because it, it made the victory more I don't know. I, I think it made it so much more wholesome. Like it became about, you know, Joe proving something like 
to himself like internally not about this like external victory or something but like just seeing like him being able to watch himself and watch you know those that support him like win alongside him you know at you know a sport rather than this sort of like life and death sort of you know like i have to survive by killing my opponent like yeah that's mm -hmm. that's not real victory because you've you've you have you know in your victory you have caused death and sorrow to another and that's not real victory you know his his joe's win in the end is is bigger than that like it's it's something that you know where you know yuri even gets to you know you know live to go on another day and to sort of you know enter the next stage of his life and so does junk dog so it's it's got a very very happy ending that you wouldn't yeah. normally expect from something like this and i yeah, thought that I was, was awesome I, I was really pleased by my expectations of being subverted because yeah i, I agree with that that we see them reach the next stage of their lives and i really when you see all of the the, the the whole there's a whole lot of dog imagery throughout that the show practically beats over your head well, I, they're more like wolves yeah uh, yeah i mean you've got like so you've got junk dog like the stray dog that's the yeah, very wolf, very feral creature compared to Yuri, that's very much a domesticated wolf. And we you know, we talk about like his owner and how he's pretty much just a, a slave really for this corporation. So to see him even himself be able to break out of that in the end and even live a happy life in the new gym was really, really cool. Yeah, and it was interesting with Yuri where at first I was like, Oh, so you're Ivan Drago from Rocky Four. <laughs> <laughs> but uh no he has his own progression arc where basically he he's there to show off um what's the company's name satru shirado yeah yeah shirado's tech with his enhancements but because of just what he sees in joe and his just ferocity as a fighter he decides that um I am going to take my enhancements off and fight him as a true boxer, as partially a sign of respect, partially to prove his own strength. Uh, that's not part of the augments, and I think that, for me, was a bigger deal than the actual their actual fight. Just him willingly going through all the agony and pain of. Like, there's some gruesome scenes of you just hear him just screaming in a basement. Just, uh, like, ba it's, it sounds like he's basically going through a detox. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so I've got a question. i got a question for you guys. So, basically, the whole, like, hook in the original, like, pitch for this show and, like, the original and trailers the and the marketing. <laughs> yeah, and, the, and and then the poster and stuff. It's all about, like, you know, this is... This is Ashita no Joe, but like sci-fi with these, you know, crazy augmented like cyborg like punching glove arms. But basically the entire show is just like, nah, it ain't really about this at all. Like it's it's about basically the show basically tells you all that's a load of crap. Um, and the show is really about like getting back to what it means to be like in competition, like as like again kind of against yourself like to win not against others but against yourself um without using all of these like fancy tech stuff so i mean i i find that really really funny and 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 neat to think about because like the show kind of it, it craps on its own marketing and it was probably intentionally doing that so when i first heard about megalobox i thought it was going to be an anime adaptation of those not legos mega me mega blocks <laughs> <laughs> and i kind of i kind of uh, you know ignored it from there but when everyone started talking about it i really looked deeper into it and yeah like on the service level it's just like robot boxing which oh, it didn't seem all that great but there's something something catches you in that you know, the visual style the musical style there's something so very stylistic about the show that even if you're not a huge i, mean, I don't really care about Thing. I don't follow MMA or anything like that, so I didn't really have a hook in that regard. So to just kind of follow it blind for the most part, uh, I, I was really surprised by it. Yeah, I, th I think I would definitely agree with that as well. Like that's that that's not that's definitely not what intrigued me about the show. What what intrigued me most was 
just the really the set design and the uh and the musical score because you know I, I watched the trailer for it and i thought oh this looks kind of neat this reminds me of some things that i've liked before it's kind of got that sort of gritty aesthetic kind of like cowboy bebop or samurai shampoo or uh a lot of those um uh, sayo yamamoto works and and things like that and uh, that's what got me interested in checking it out. If this was just like another sort of straight up adaptation of uh, of like a more strict like anime about boxing, you know, I don't I don't know if I would have been intrigued by it. But a lot of what makes this show good and um, what hooked it in, especially for me, and it seems like for you as well, Tobias, is just that that aesthetic uh, to it uh, paired with the the very very unique uh, musical score. Yeah. I think that plays it for for a lot of a lot of people. Well, I I think that aesthetic is kind of the icing on the is icing on the cake because it's so detailed and the animation is so fluid. Like uh, especially in its the the boxing scenes, like they're that's that's one thing I applaud the show is they don't skimp out on when they're in the ring, the the fights. They don't use shortcuts uh, during them. They only use it during the last fight, but I, I'm fine with that choice because it's more of an artistic choice of how they show um, Yuri and uh, Nambu and uh, and Joe's um, feelings during that fight. But throughout, just it's stylistically on point and, and kind of matches the characters if it's very run down it's there's a lot of grime to it and it just like our main characters of they're not part of the shiny corporation that's super clean and super nice so i i think that fits but what what i think is the cake of this show and what can be the cake of a lot of sports shows is it's not the actual sport itself it's the characters and what the sport gives to them is that drive or that goal and I think that's the key to any sports show is not the sport itself. And this could be this is the same thing for for in real life is just the personalities of what there's the story behind the sport. And I think it's interesting how the show does not really give us much about about junk dog himself like we know very little about the guy. So basically the way that the audience is supposed to feel about joe is that you know our understanding of who he is is by what we see him do and what we see him hear him say and what um what relationships he forms in the show as we're watching it like there's not really a huge level of backstory that we get for him so i I think that's an interesting way to build a character that you know we're basically seeing joe revealed as we watch the show well i i think that's a common character choice of just like that origin stuff from the past that really doesn't matter to the plot it's kind and other should other shows have done that like um this is a western show like doctor who like you don't really care about the origins of the doctor it's cool but you don't really care what shows that character is his actions and just like you're saying joe's actions and his personality show who that character is and what i think another thing they consider i think is the time frame so the original tomorrow joe ran about like 70 to 80 episodes this ran 13 so you got to do a very similar arc to that a a lot less time so the little bits we catch of, of joe's backstory or like you said revealed throughout and I like that because it makes a rewatch a little more entertaining. I actually started the series uh, a couple of times. Uh, so watched the first two, two or three episodes. Uh, restarted those a few times before I actually finished. And getting a little bits of those, the little bits of story, the motivations that you pick up, just watching him and the way he reacts to the city around him uh, really brings more on a rewatch. And I, I think the other trade-off too is in the original series, it's more of a shonen tournament show, probably, of, okay, now he has to go through this fighter, and this fighter has a particular skill or a particular trait, whereas that's not really the case of Megalobox is not a tournament fighter, like a Yu Yu Hakusho or a, um, a typical shonen show. 
I mean, it's not, I would say the original is not, from what I at least know, it's not so typical term. I mean, and to be fair, Megalobox does push us right into Megalonia, so it kind of is as well. But well, a, lot of, a, lot of the, a lot of the importance there is following the character's development and how he reacts to, you know, making it, as it were, like taking his frustrations, these feelings he has as an abandoned person, you know, society around him, it just kind of moved on. And making a name for himself by his skill and his ferocity, which we see in both characters. Um, we've been talking a lot about Joe, but I, I think we need to all, we need to spread the love to some of the other characters. Like, <laughs> I, I I love his um, trainer Nambu. Yep. Like, at first he's just he's a pure scaredy cat of just like I'll do whatever I can to pay off this debt, and I don't care. We're where he has this mentality of just like this is our lot in life, and we're we're never destined to go to the top, and we should just accept that. But uh, I like his development because at first we just see him as just that sleazy kind of you know scorpion. They kind of compare him to the scorpion later. Yeah, the, there's like, a. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm into. There's a. I love that story bit of just like you're like the scorpion, where the the mobster says like, there's a story of the scorpion trying to cross the river, and. Uh, the, scorpion, the scorpion sees a frog, and the frog says, uh, "If I let you, if I help you to get it past the river, I'll, you'll just kill me." Uh, and he said, "Like, no, you won't. No, I won't, because if I kill you, then uh, I'll drown too." And then, uh, but the scorpion still uh, stings the frog just because it's in his own nature. I, I, I love, love that it. moment. I love that little mini story. Uh, and I think at first that that's true about Nambu, but. As the show progresses, he grows more attached to this, to Joe and to the family of Team Nowhere, where he sees that I can pull myself up and I can uh, go beyond my, where my lot in life is. I think what really turned me around is the, the part midway through the show where Joe has to fight his uh, his old student. Aragaki. That's the best. Oh my, that's the best <laughs> story in the. That's my favorite. That's my favorite storyline in the that's, entire that's show. Yes. About, that's how I feel about really the episode of Megalobox. Is like I remember an episode. And it's like, oh my god, that was so great. <laughs> like, oh, that that storyline is so brutal. We're basic. We're basically um, Nambu when he was still on his feet and still a respected trainer. One of his students was drafted to the military, uh, and Nambu says, "I will be." here waiting for you when you come back because this, this gym is your home and what happens is he uh, gets uh, ensnared by an IUD a bomb and um, loses his leg and he's pursued missing for an entire year um, so Nambu moves on thinking that people was dead um, and he is very sad about this death he has regret about what has happened. He sort of turns to alcohol, sort of numb that, numb the pain. But then uh, it's revealed that you know he lived, and um, he was on the verge of killing himself. But what saved him was this meal ticket that Nambu gave him that said, "Like here, um, and then when you come back." I'll treat you to a very nice meal. And when he sees that, he just starts crying with the gun in his mouth. Yeah, that, like, was a, oh. that was a great part. Oh, that, that was so hard to watch. That's that's brutal. Uh, but it's, and just the, the storyline between them two of just like, at first you think it's the military, uh, his his former student trying to get revenge on Nambu for abandoning him or his the feeling yeah. of abandonment. As as it progresses, it's there's more to it than that. But I'm I'm talking too much. Tobias or Austin, you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like that character that character arc as well because it reveals just so much about about Nanbu as a character. Uh, like we see him, we, it's sort of the opposite that we see that we see of Joe. Like we get a lot of where Nanbu came from, and to see like you know his his beginnings as a legit trainer and then his sort of you know uh you know his de-escalation into getting involved with the mob and all of those things that, and how that how all these events sort of changed him as a person and how we can watch we watch him like throughout the course of the story um through his relationship with joe and with uh Sachio, 
sort of, you know, turn over a new leaf again and sort of, you know, reevaluate, you know, what he's doing with his life, uh, what he sees as his regrets and his successes uh, with Aragaki. Um, and to see the, just the contrast between Aragaki and Joe, like to see them sort of be rivals and then turn around and be, you know, peers and compatriots with each other. It's it's some really excellent storytelling in that in that middle arc. It's just yeah. you know, it's really good. I see. I feel like then we capture like the major theme of both uh, tomorrow's show and Megalobox is you know working for tomorrow, capturing yes. tomorrow to the point where the outcome of that fight is uh, Aragaki just you know letting go of this pain and these issues he he's had you know cooped up inside of him, and just he's wanting to live for tomorrow's progress rather than today's struggles. And you see that in Nanbu as well, like the full culmination of that idea because I think. I think Nanbu is the character that realizes that first off, like first in the show. Um, and then he sort of passes on that, that idea to Joe. He's just like, we gotta, we gotta live in the moment, but remember that what we do in this moment sets our course for tomorrow. Like, but always be looking for tomorrow in the moment. Um, like whenever we see, you know, after he and Joe sort of have that spat and then the, um, uh, then Joe refuses to throw the match like he's supposed to for the mob. And then the mobster, you know, literally rips out Nanbu's other eye and he's blind now. No, um, no, no. Nanbu willingly gives up his eye. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. But but either way, like he, he loses his eye to to that guy. Um, but we there's never a moment like at least we don't see it. The show doesn't present it to us. There's never a moment where. Nanbu sort of is where he regrets that decision because we instantly see him like looking for looking towards tomorrow like even though he's blind now like that never really comes up he just takes his circumstance that he's dealt with in that moment the consequences of of both what happened to him and sort of the place that he got himself into like he's he's decided that none of that matters it only matters what I do moving forward now um, and, and that and, goes into like what and how, how he trains um, Joe to get ready for Megalonia and what they do, you know, a year later afterwards in founding the new gym. Like it, there's never a complaint from Nambu. There's never a moment where we see him going through like a woe is me. Why did this happen to me? Even though he does a lot of that early on in the show, he has a lot of like regrets that he voices and things that he could feel bad about. But he doesn't do that anymore because he learned that lesson. And I think that's really important, uh, a really important sort of driving home feature of the show. It's like whatever happens to you, there's always tomorrow. And that's that's the way you have to look at it in both things you can control and can't control. Exactly. Uh, what do we think of um, Sachiro, <laughs> the uh, little kid that is uh, joins Team Nowhere kind of near the middle <laughs> of the show? So going into him, like I, I think I had most people's opinions where when they the kids first show up, like, oh great, it's gonna be some annoying brats that are gonna follow him around. Oh well, man. The, the, but, the, like moving into like I feel like he he developed on his own pretty well. And we talked about that episode where you know Nanbu, things go down with Nanbu and the, the resolution of that arc. Like I feel like that beyond the Aragaki scenes or was my favorite episode, the one where he fights the bloody lion. Uh, Bros. Yes. <laughs> and that episode was so good. Like, because we have like Sachio like realizing things are messed up. Like he's he he runs off and does his own like double man crybaby style rap segment. Uh, it just shows <laughs> I up. That. I don't know, like 2018 is just a great year for, for hip hop and anime, but that was amazing. And he sort of like he realizes that no, it's not all lost. And like he he runs back. And like he yells out, you know, Joe, don't give up, like get up where you can do this. And then like Yuri shows up and also like everything about that episode was just so great. Oh man, I love it. So uh, I really like Sachio's development as well. I'm I'm gonna rain on your parade a little bit. Sorry. Here we go. Okay. I like him a lot. And his storyline of just like, oh my dad, he was a designer and for for the Sachin Sachio's uh the Sachin Corporation. Uh but then they saw his work and designs, and I felt that was a compelling story of just when Nabu takes him to um, the who's the Mikiko. president? 
yeah, thank you. The president's headquarters and says, like, here, you can get your revenge now. I, I'm here to help you, but you have to be the one that has to do it. And then he sees the the other children and he's like, I know I can't. I can't do uh, what they did to me. I think that's a compelling arc. The one thing I don't like is that throwaway bit of like she she finds out and she says, gather up the list of everyone that's been that was who did this and they will be dealt with. It just that seemed very throwaway to me. Uh, and also just as a occurring so as a as a nerd in general, a lot of boxing movies that always have the little kid character like there's this old boxing movie that's been remade twice called The Champ, where this little kid follows this main boxer and he gets really invested and it, it's very similar to Sachio, whereas at first he's kind of a cynical kind of run down as a kid, but what he sees in Joe is hope. And it's it's a common uh trope I see in uh in you'd see in boxing movies like the like the champ. But it it wasn't annoying. Like he he played a role in the in the team of the stats and Here's how the enhancements, the the actual tech that most of the boxers are using, uh, how they will affect Joe in the fight. He was not fighting without any gear, uh, so I th- I felt like he was used well, and his story overall was good. Um, I- I'm glad he wasn't just the little kid of just constantly going, "Yeah, Joe," <laughs> and that was his con. That wasn't his constant role, which I think they used him well. I really liked his brief interaction with Yuri uh, during the final fight uh, where he sees Yuri drop his water bottle and then uh, goes over to to hand him a water bottle um, from from their stuff. And Yuri's just like, I don't need your pity. And he's just like, I'm, I'm not doing this out of pity. I'm doing this because I genuinely admire you for going at this alone. And I'm just like, that's that's some really good character development there, too, because that, that's such a wise thing for a kid to say. Just. I, I don't know. I, I that that stood out to me for some reason. I feel like when you we talk about, and this may be a little more controversial, you're probably gonna disagree with me. When we talk about Megalobox as a whole, I feel like the general plot is the weakest part, just because it's so trope heavy. We talk about you know Sacho being just that that similar tropish character. We have these like very obvious lines, like you, you mentioned, like oh I, I respect you. It's that's what. That's literally what's happening on the screen. We, we look at the overarching plot of just this fighter, like scrapping his way up into, in, you know, into like a respectful name for himself. Like, I feel like if you take away the anime parts of it and just look at the story, Mega Box just sounds like every other boxing story ever told. But so much of what I feel like is important in the show is it's just the, the aesthetic, the visuals, the music, everything about that really it's like inspired me and kept me to keep watching this show yeah you know here's my analogy for megalobox i think i I think i this just came into my head okay megalobox is like mass effect in that the main storyline overall isn't that interesting what's interesting is the character interactions and the characters individual plots just like in megalobox where in Megalobox, you, you're interested in uh, characters that are introduced, like the military, uh, uh, the military boxer who is trying to get uh, find his way or find redemption. Or I love the brother of the um, corporate president and how he was trying to prove with his AI technology that I am the best. Now, if you took away the character plots, I would agree with you. The overarching plot would be pretty boring of just the scrappy boxer going to number one. That's pretty boring. But what spices it up is those character interactions and plots. Yeah, no, I, and I would agree with that. For sure. that. That's the cake. And what the icing is, is the music and the aesthetic. I don't think that's a controversial idea, Tobias. I mean, the... the, the um the narrative in of itself is, is nothing that we haven't seen before. And um, that doesn't make it bad by any yeah, means. But sure. it's, it's certainly not revolutionary and it's like narrative structure or anything like that. But what Bill said, like really seeing the characters go through their journey and the fact that we get to see them go through their journey in such a very well delivered package visually and aesthetically and directorially 
um, is kind of what makes the show worth watching. Like if you're looking for something that is very, it's going to like blow your mind with, with plot twists and like interesting, you know, like unique concepts and stuff like that. This isn't really the show for you, but if you're looking for something that is, it has some very interesting characters that you can last on to, uh, this is, this is something that I think you'll appreciate. Yeah. I mean, we talked about like the, uh, the whole Glenn Burroughs fight. Like around to Megalonia, like we all knew Joe was going to be them. That was going to yeah. happen. He was going to. They were obviously going to win the fight, despite you know Fujimaki, the the mob guy, you know having uh, Nanbu pretty much held hostage. Like we knew Joe was going to win. That that was going to happen, obviously. But even then, like that whole episode, and I don't do this for for like man stuff that I watch. But like I'm literally yelling at the TV. Like I'm watching an actual watching. It's like I'm pumping my fist. I'm excited. Like every time he's a comeback, when Sachio shows up and Yuri shows up behind him, I had to pause it and just like yell yes a couple times. Like that was just <laughs> it was it was so hype. And yeah, like you like I said, like of course he was going to win. Of course he was gonna come back. That's not what the surprise. But to see how they framed it, how they had the characters show up, the music adds to that, the visual choices add to that. Like Oh man, this, I, I I say that I feel like all that aesthetic is a little bit more than icing. Granted, I'm the kind of guy that likes a lot of icing on cake, so maybe <laughs> that works for me. But I feel like that is so so important to watch the show. And God, I, I love it. I, no, I agree with you. I think it's just from my perspective. I'm I'm used to watching older. Sh- I'm used to watching shows that don't have the very pretty aesthetic. Like, uh, some it's not the same show, but. Like ping pong, for example, is so is super character based, and I it's not as heavy as Megaloboxes, but it has a very strong character narrative similar oh, yeah. to Megalobox, but it doesn't have that pretty icing. That well, see, I, 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 I can disagree, disagree with the aesthetic because like, there's a lot of they use that aesthetic, the framing, and the comic book style framing oh my gosh. to really great effect. They're like, sure, it doesn't look as pretty as a lot of modern anime, like, it has a very you know, you also style to it. Well, like, you should go back and rewatch it because there's a lot of visual elements that you just like they do in Megalobox that frames. And I think it's another thing I, I like. I myself don't really watch a lot of sports anime, but watching Megalobox and Ping Pong and even uh, Hanibato, the Batman anime that just started coming out, like I'm realizing a lot more getting into these character interactions and their growth. And I'm realizing that both Megalobox and Ping Pong both had this very strong mm. visual element to, to guide you into that. Let's let's talk about the aesthetic since we've been kind of hinting at it. Like yeah. we've 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 kind of talked about it a bit, but what what kind of draws you into the aesthetic? Because I I feel like the animation is top quality. Like I the only time the animation is when it's a one-on-one conversation and someone's clothes looks a little pink, but otherwise it looks astounding to me. Oh, for sure. It's got it man, it's just it seeps you into the whole world that it's built for itself here. You don't see that a whole lot in anime where they focus on getting something that's very pretty visually, just making sure the art is really, I don't know, very visually pleasing itself. But this they, they focus more on the world building itself. There's very much this gritty grittiness to pretty much everything around it. Uh, they they definitely focus on both these 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 dingy slum areas, contrasting it with this this really high class, really nice you know skyscraper, high rise, super clean city. Yeah, yeah. They really there's a really big contrast there, and all that ties together. And I'm sure you guys feel it too. Like there's very much a Cowboy Bebop style feel to this show. Very much a Watanabe feeling. I definitely got vibes like I was watching something off like Adult Swim or Cartoon Network from like the mid 2000s. And yeah, I, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. No, but I was going to wait on comment. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Sh- I wouldn't be shocked if this ends up on Toonami. Or, that wouldn't shock me uh, either. Uh, because this, this is right up their alley. It's through the aesthetic um i think it would be a great fit for them and i i hope it lands on on tsunami's door uh oh yeah I, I, i'm absolutely sure with this picking it up i guarantee you we're gonna get a dub and that 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 also is gonna get it Tsunami's gonna get it 
Can I say a controversial opinion? Uh, okay. Okay. So I'm, I was honestly not a fan of the uh, filtering that they did over that show. I think it made it, you know, in, in the spirit of them trying to make it look like retro, I think they just made it look messy. And that's what? just my personal so opinion. So to put a, sort of comment on that here, for those of you who are in the know, uh, this is a thing noted from an interview that the Sakaga blog had translated and reposted. Uh, you can check that on uh, blog.sakagaburu.com where basically what they had done is they wanted to give it a like a retro old school feeling, but they didn't just want to overlay some you know, Photoshop filters and grain effects to make it look old, you know, artificially. So what they did is the, the entire production is drawn in an HD scale. They have downscaled it down into like SD resolution and then upscaled it back into the full HD. So it has this very blurry feel to it. And I feel like it works. I feel like it's one of those things that reminds me very much of watching anime and watching, you know, fan sub stuff way back in the like the middle 2000s, because you would see that where everything just looked slightly more blurry than if you're watching a DVD production of something. And something about that like adds to the Watanabe vibe for me, because we watched these shows on Toonami, on Adult Swim back in the day. So to have both the music you know, the music quality, the, the 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 world building, the detail there, but also having this nostalgic filter basically added to everything really makes it work for me. And I can see it not working for some people, especially people that maybe started watching anime this decade and are more used to HD quality stuff. But I don't know, like it just it clicks with me, like it just it works very well. Yeah, I. Mm, I, I'm sorry, ahead, Bill. Yeah, I, for me, it clicked for me really well. The only time I noticed the blurriness where I was just kind of like, huh, that's weird, was during individual conversations where just their clothing looked like, looks like they didn't finish this. Uh, <laughs> this the this hat or this this piece of clothing or this shirt they were wearing, I'm just like, it's blurriness. But during the, what I feel is the more important scenes, like the fights, um, they, I didn't notice that kind of muddiness, kind of blurriness that Austin was talking about. Yeah, I, I don't know why. It just, it didn't, it, it, it stood out to me as distracting. And I guess maybe that's because like a lot of the, even a lot of the retro anime that I've watched in like the last five, six years or so has been like, like retro anime in 1080p, like HD remasters of old yeah. stuff. Like just like dis discotheque releases. <laughs> yeah, just like seeing how just how absolutely beautiful um like cell animation looks on Blu-ray quality. Like and that that to me is like the the best way that you can watch that sort of stuff. But I, I feel like maybe there was a better way for them to make it feel nostalgic without having to do that. Because I don't know, it just made it look messy to me. And I, and that's totally a personal subjective thing. Like I, and I totally understand why people would be cool with it, find that piece of nostalgia, you know, definitely present there and something that they could latch on to. But uh, it just, it didn't work for me. It just looked meh. I mean, the, 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 the author of the post on the Sakaka blog uh, agrees with you in that regard. Goes by you, Kyle, uh, Kevin on Twitter uh, agrees with that. Like, it kind of has a net negative effect to the series as a whole, where they could have, you know, his opinion, could have found better ways to emulate an older style. So I can see it for sure not working for everybody. Well, I'm I'm just happy that it wasn't a. Uh, it didn't seem like it was a it was a stylistic choice, and it wasn't a budget issue, like other shows that have been ruined because of budgetary issues, like with what happened to. Um, oh, now I'm blanking. Austin, what was that show that was the gangsta? Gangsta, the gangsta yeah. For example, that towards the end that even though that show had a really cool aesthetic like they had to use really tacky shortcuts animation wise because they were running out of money as a studio so they just had to get this done whereas this was a more artistic choice and as an artistic choice for me it didn't bother me it just it popped up here and again but it, it wasn't a pres uh, an annoying presence throughout the show like uh, mid 2000s CGI. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, that's so true. 
I hope we never see a nostalgia, you know, for that come around. Oh man, Gonzo type CGI <laughs> shows coming back. Ooh. That beautiful dragon in Fate Stay Night 2006. <laughs> mm. Ooh. That dragon's quite a looker. Yeah. <laughs> but um as a brief segue, um, you mentioned the music. And the music yes. for me is a is a interesting blend where yes, it does have the hip hop vibe the Jim Rice shampoo does, but it also has this can kind of have this 80s aesthetic with um the opening song. That opening song screams we're a new wave band. It, yeah. Like it's <laughs> it's 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 the cult or uh I'm trying to think of another new wave, uh like Danzig, something like that. Uh, yeah, just the, the the way that opening song is, and they mix it in with the the hip hop, like the the kind of a uh, that little intermediate beat that plays just before the open it before the show starts with the still that usually oh, is yeah. a representative of the of the show. Um, the eye catch. The, yeah, thank you. The eye catch. I should know that from One Piece. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, uh, it's it's it's, an, it's a good blend. Like, I think one thing that might be misleading to listeners is because we're bringing up bebop. Uh, it, it's similar to bebop. You're not going to get a full on Yaku Kano jazz soundtrack, so don't don't expect that coming into the Megalobox. It just it has a unique soundtrack that it's it's not typical of normal anime productions. Where it's an interesting blend of music, and I wouldn't say it's it's stuck with one genre. No, and I like it. Go ahead, yeah. awesome. I was gonna say, like, I ab- absolutely adore the soundtrack for this show, and I was listening to it a little bit earlier today, just on its own outside of the show, um, and it it holds up very well as just pieces of music to listen to. Like that particular musical artist is just excellent. And while I do think there are a few times, um, especially if you are like marathoning the show, how like some of the themes, I think they overuse a little bit, um, especially watching it from episode to episode. But if you watched it weekly, that would probably not be a problem. Um, But and that kind of irritated me, but it was never to the point where I felt like, gosh, I hate this song like that was. That never came across. It was just some a minor annoyance. Yeah, um, I mean, you, but... you, you definitely start recognizing like the main theme and some of the other themes. But every time they show up, it's always there to really hype you up. Yes. And like all it does is like spice up what's going on on the screen. It has, like you said, the icing. Like you know what's happening. You know stuff's about to go down. But that icing hits. And like, oh man, here it comes. And it's really different from all the other music in the show, but I love that ending song. It's so oh, good. Yeah. So, so the ending is Kakete Koyo by Nakamura Emi that I, I they just got into thanks to Megalobox, but I've been jamming out of her stuff uh, pretty much ever since the show started coming out. And she, oh man, she's so great. Please go check out more of her music. Uh, I love the ending. Like as you guys know, like I love the visual effects, even though they're not really overblown. Where it's not like a full you know ending animation. But just like the neon lights that are like you know glowing and in, in, in time with the music and just the oh man it's perfect i love it it's minimalistic but remaining stylish and i think that's yeah. really cool oh yeah man and like the like you said mission like the like the, the, the major themes the, the actual main theme and some of the other ones like they're very reminiscent of, of like jock jams or something you would hear played during a boxing match I can I can hear these songs being played if I were to turn on like an MMA fight or something. But all they did was like really like un- enunciate and just act as, I guess a uh, you know just accent everything that's happening like on the screen at that point. It, it worked so so well. Um. So to you guys individually, like, what do you think? What like having finished the show, like, what do you think is the sequence or the particular scene? or shot or moment that will stand that has stood out to you the most and which one do you think will continue to stand out to you the most um for me i think this the not a particular scene but the storyline with uh Ambu and his former student that will stick with me um just that whole arc where he becomes joe's sparring partner towards the end um mm-hmm. 
it that that where he basically goes through a whole little small arc within the show of that I I really grew attached to, and I, I think just his story, um, especially towards the end where they they forfeit the fight because his trainer knows like we need to end this because if if you keep fighting you're gonna lose your ability to walk, and even though you lost the fight that was the greatest fight I had ever seen that of him helping him walk back to the bag. That that really stuck with me. Tobias? I'm actually going to let you go because I've got a couple and I don't want to steal your thunder. Okay. Um, I probably have a couple as well. Like uh, One of the scenes that really stands out to me is, um, is the first scene in the very beginning where Joe is on the motorcycle. Um, like he's, he's, there's, there's that little monologue that he says like right before the, uh, the title card pops up and it's just like him doing like a crazy jump like instantly on the show so you, you already kind of know that this show is going to be like really hype and it's going to be about like joe reaching for the stars and all that stuff so that really stood that stood out to me i think i'm going to remember that for a long time that, that, I, think, I think that scene made me think a lot of uh mad max fury road specifically yeah yeah you know, i can we, definitely we, see we that. have like the desert then we have his like uh, mad you know uh, max's monologue with you know who are we the the, the last remaining people in this in this hellscape and Oh, uh, yeah, it made me think of that a lot. Mm-hmm. And another scene that I think really stands out is is just, um, like, obviously that final uh, that final punch between uh, Yuri and uh, and Joe, like, at the very end, where they do that iconic, like, what did you say that was called again? Cross counter. The cross counter, yeah. Like, that. that's a very iconic moment. And just that really, really cute scene at the end where you see Joe uh, dancing on the beach. Like, I, yeah. I love that. That was good. So I, I probably stole some of yours. Maybe not, but who knows? Well, this is the first one. Like, I think the opening is really great. Like I said, it reminds me a lot of Mad Max. And uh, Fury Road is an excellent, excellent movie. Uh, that, uh, the part where in the middle of the second episode where he's riding his bike through the city and it starts playing this, like, hip-hop song. And we see bits and pieces of, of the slums around. And he rides into the city and sees that big billboard. Oh, you know, yeah. It's, uh, the, the average, you know, yes, is, uh, you know, you're the you're wonderful, it's a wonderful district life, not for your average Joe. And he sort of looks at it and gives it that look. And that's just, the music works well. Seeing the big sign, this huge lit up sign, like get translated from Japanese to English. That leading into the last scene, where you know, all the stuff's gone down, they got this set, they're gonna go to Megaloni, it's gonna happen. And then he's like, all right, what are they, I need your name. What, what name are you gonna pick? And he, like, he just like, he growls Joe. Oh my God, that is so perfect. <laughs> I love that scene so much. And uh, I think uh, near the end, like I said, the, the, the fight against the, the lion, Glenn Bros, like that whole scene, like that whole episode, like it was perfect. Again, like, I guess for me, as someone who enjoys, you know, film, I think what I enjoy most is cinematography and the actual visual language of what's happening on screen. So a lot of the scenes that resonate with me for the long, the long haul are things which are just something about everything that happens there on screen, and just seeing that and seeing like Sachio show up out of nowhere after he'd given up to cheer Joe on, knowing that. Uh, you know, Nanbu is just gonna forsake his own life or whatever to to, to let it happen. You know, showing seeing Yuri show up out of nowhere, like that was that was great. I love that part. Doesn't he say something like, "Don't forget what you promised me, Joe," or something like that? Yeah, exactly. Like, you can't yeah. you can't let it in here. Like, oh man, it's so good. Yes. <laughs> I um, okay. I have two kind of wrap up questions. Well, okay. one that we could kind of end on, but okay, like we mentioned before, Viz has acquired Megalobox, which I, based on what I saw on Twitter, people were really surprised by. Um, and I think the reason why people were surprised is because typically Viz only does very long shonen shows like Naruto and Bleach uh, or Inuyasha, and this is one of the rare times where they do a show that's kind of a smaller, not, not a small show, but it's not a, a long-running franchise they're known for. And so I'm going to be curious to see who they get to be in the dub cast, and if they do dub it, and um, 
how they're going to release this because uh, uh, not to say that I don't like Viz, but Viz's track record with smaller shows have been up and down. Like they kind of buried Tiger and Bunny, and they uh, <laughs> and everyone remembers the Warner Brothers uh, Joe Joe Bizarre Adventure release and how that wasn't their fault. <laughs> that wasn't their fault. Okay, no. I thought I thought they distributed through Warner Brothers, so. No, no, no. That was Warner Brothers doing it. Like that was like Warner Brothers Japan trying to do it through Warner Brothers US. Uh, and then okay. thankfully, thankfully Viz was able to get the rights to JoJo and like I I don't have one myself, but I've seen them in real life and looked at it like the reprinting of JoJo season 1 and I think they just put out part 1 of Stardust Crusaders is like super nice. It's really okay. really good. Okay. My bad. I thought it was Viz for some reason. Not my bad. But um, I'm just. I hope that they give Megalo Box a big push through marketing and get it on Tsunami. And because out of all the shows that are in a very strong spring season, including stuff that I was even hyped for, like a new Lupin, a Legend of the Galactic Heroes reboot. Oh my God! Like Megalo Box, surprisingly for me, topped. Both of those, two of my most anticipated shows of the spring. I mean, I wow. said those that both of you can can you know uh, uh, what a uh, cheese. What word am I looking for? So a I said this back. Um, do I? A test. Yes, exactly. So let's start over. And I I said this back then. And both of you both attest that I have it in writing. Like I called Megalobox being like anime of the season, and I'm calling <laughs> it now. Like it's it's going to be anime of the year for a lot of people, including me. It's it's great. It is absolutely. If you see nothing this season, if you see nothing, uh, you know this year except for one show, make it Megalobox. I mean, hell, this is a year with mm-hmm. what we had two trigger productions year. so far, and I. That's, <laughs> that's, okay, let's, let's all let's all collectively forget that Darling and the Franks ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, so we're having we're gonna have one trigger production in the fall. <laughs> yeah, just one. <laughs> and I'm You're, saying that Megalobox is winning out. Yeah. And you've got the big heavy hitters coming this summer with Attack on Titan coming, and uh, <laughs> uh, a lesser extent, Gintama is, is back, and we've yeah, My Hero Academia is still going, and well, I, I love I love those shows to, to a certain degree. I, I think Megalobox just has a special quality that when we do our top ten list for the year, it's gonna it's gonna go going to go on there yeah for sure and we talk about compared to like the, the more popular stuff you know at the crunchyroll anime awards this past year made in abyss won a good bit of stuff and that was kind of a last minute you know show that just kind of popped up in people's minds so i kind of think that if people remember megalobox you know at the end of the year when we get to voting time i can see megalobox winning a couple of awards at these crunchyroll this well, should hire higher... <laughs> sorry go ahead Viz should hire you, Tobias, to be their personal PR person for Megalobox on Twitter. <laughs> I, I will be. I will be the non-boo to Viz's be, jump dog. Be, be Megalobox's hype man. <laughs> yeah, I, I will be the raging alcoholic that eventually loses both eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Um, I think one thing that that is a net positive for the fact that Viz has gotten this show is that they are pretty good about making their, about getting their popular stuff out on Netflix. So like, if you look at the Viz shows on Netflix, like you've got Naruto and you've got um, One Punch Man and Tiger and Bunny and Inuyasha and all that sort of stuff. And I feel like Megalobox has, it has this very appealing look to it. Like I could easily see a lot of people being intrigued by its like icon on Netflix if they're just browsing by. And it's got the really cool title. Um, So I could easily see this show getting like a very, very easy like second wind if it, um, if like after the English dub and everything comes out, if this, if Viz puts it up on Netflix. I think that would be a really, really great, great way to sort of solidify the shows, like, um, like to take it into that next level of popularity. Because I think, it, I think it could do it. I really do. Is there anything else that you wanted to address before we wrap this guy up? <laughs> um, you covered it pretty well. Uh, of course, if any of you viewers have any further questions or want to discuss something, you can use all our social media accounts to do so. But I think we covered it all to a good degree. I think so yeah. too. This was a good chat, guys. Yeah, I, I, I'm. What got me into checking out Megalobox was 
um, to buy a year review of it on the site. And I I checked it out and I I got hooked and I I just can't believe that it it, it topped Lupin and Heroes for me and I, for for me to say that personally that that means a lot because the Lupin as everyone knows is it's it's my baby and so for for for, for, hey, for Lupin the third is your son you are Lupin the second <laughs> <laughs> you damn right I, it's on my birth certificate. <laughs> I got the DNA test right here. <laughs> uh, the, the, it's a strong statement for me personally to say that Megalobox is, is my favorite show of the spring. And we'll, we'll see what summer and fall has to offer, but I, I, I have a hard time feeling that Megalobox is going to be topped. But we shall see. And I think um, if you guys out there are fans of shows like like Ping Pong, the animation, like like other sports anime and whatnot, and and stuff that has that similar aesthetic to things like Bebop, like Michiko and Hachi. And I really think that you guys ought to give Megalobox a chance if you haven't already watched it. Also, but Sorry, selfish, selfish plug. Go back, if you want to learn more about Ping Pong, go back into our archives and go check out the sports episode that I did where we talked oh, about yeah. Ping Pong and how awesome it is. And also, if you, with all our Ping Pong talk, you can pick up Ping Pong for really super cheap. For about twenty bucks or lower, depending on where you're getting it, and it's uh, totally worth it. And even if you hate that like green label uh, on the spine, you could just flip it around, and it doesn't and, hack and matter. And same for Miko and Hachin too. That's also really cheap. yes, definitely. All right, guys. Well, thank you guys so much for being on this podcast episode. It's always a pleasure to have you. And Tobias, where can people talk to you on Twitter about uh, Megaloboxing? Well, you can agree with me about the series on Twitter uh, at <laughs> Reverend underscore Tobias. And Bill, where can people find your true gearless champion self on the Twitter? Um, you can find me at WB Foreman 999, where I'll talk about looping with you. Hearthstone, which new expansion's coming pretty soon, probably. Uh, <laughs> it, it's probably. So sorry. Uh, yeah, they, they gave a teaser uh, announcement. But anyway, that's a tangent for another podcast. Uh, <laughs> and I, yeah. And as yeah. for myself, yeah. uh, you can find me at Bebop Shock, and that's Bebop as in Cowboy Bebop, and Shock as in Bioshock, and that's where you can find me on Twitter. And Third Impact in general, you can find on uh, twitter.com slash t slash uh, ti underscore anime. Oh man, I can't speak for some reason. And if you want to keep up with more about what we do, please go visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash third impact anime. Um, and like I said, right before the break, uh, please pop on over to that Facebook page and give us a rating and a review. Just let us know your thoughts on the show. Let us know your thoughts on some of our panels, if you've ever been able to attend some of them. And our next convention will be ARC in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, at the end of July. So we're very excited for that. And uh, from all of us here at Third Impact... Wait, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, go ahead. Is this, is, to, is, is this our 50th episode? No, Otaku No Video is the 50th episode. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, you can yeah, you're, you're, sorry. you're traveling in the future, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> this, is our 51st. <laughs> this is our 51st. This is our 51st episode. So but uh, anyways, thank you guys so much for listening, and we will see you in the next one. Yeah, I'm